Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us to class third annual forum on investing in young people of color. We are so thrilled that this year's forum will be co-sponsored, is co-sponsored by Cities United and the Executive Alliance for Boys and Young Men of Color. It's realizing youth justice, advancing education, employment, and youth empowerment. It's really about how can we break down barriers that our young people face, and how can we also invest in the supports that they need to help realize their true potential. In the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander suggests that the American criminal justice system, as it has come to be over the past 30 years, is a proxy for state-sanctioned discrimination against people of color, for it is, as she writes, perfectly legal to discriminate against criminal, criminals in nearly all the ways that it was once legal to discriminate against African Americans. Employment, housing, education, discrimination against felons is widely accepted in both policy and practice. But our perspective at CLASP is that reforming sentencing, reforming policing, and our criminal justice system is very important. But in addition, young people need investments in their education, they need investments in workforce development and career pathways, they need pathways to get back on the route to training and to help realize their full potential. So, this year's program will begin with welcome and remarks, followed by framing remarks by Roy Austin of the White House of the Domestic Policy Council, as well as Mayor Freeman Wilson of Gary, Indiana, who will talk about their perspectives on how we can realize justice for young people of color at the national and local level. It will be followed by two solution-focused discussions where panelists will discuss how strong programs, good policy choices and investments can move toward dismantling structural racism and combating implicit bias and help prevent young people of color from entering the criminal justice system in the first place. So before I turn it over to our executive director, Olivia Golden, I'd like to once again thank our co-sponsors for their partnership on putting on today's event for their future partnership in this advocacy effort that we fight to, one, invest in our young people, and I also would like to give a heartfelt thank you to class staff and teammates who are also responsible for helping to put together today's event, as well as our materials. Youth team members, Clarence Oku, Nia West Bay, Andrea Amici, and Dario Vasquez, and our class colleagues, Wayne Talaferro, Andy Barris, Emma Payne, and Tom Salyers. And lastly, before I turn it over to our executive director, Olivia Golden, a thank you to her for, to her, for her support and commitment to this advocacy agenda and belief that public policy does matter and can make a difference in the lives of our young people. So join me, welcome in Olivia Golden. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, can I just ask everyone who contributed from the class team to stand? And um, Keisha, please stay standing for a moment, because um, in addition to the team members that Keisha thanked, many of you already know Keisha's mix of passion and unyieldingly high intellectual standards. She holds us all to a high bar, and those of you who don't know her will learn that. Please join me in thanking the team and Keisha. So welcome to this forum on Realizing Youth Justice by Advancing Education, Employment, and Youth Empowerment, sponsored by CLASP and our two co-sponsors, as you've heard. It's extraordinary to be here. Um, for those of you who may be watching this streamed on the web, we have something like 150 people in the room, 300 more on the web. And for those of you who are not in Washington, DC, not only is it in the 90s and humid, but of course our metro system is a mess this week. So to have people actually come out in person, it really has to be an exciting topic. So thank you for being here. Why are people here? Um, I just thought maybe I would answer that in terms of why I think this is so exciting. It's an amazing group of speakers, so I wanna say thank you to all the speakers and panelists. 
We have senior leaders, as you heard, from federal, federal government and local communities, also amazing youth advocates sharing their own voice and the experiences of others. Um, we have philanthropy. Um, I'm not really sure if Michelle Henry from J.P. Morgan Chase is here yet, but um, Michelle, are you here? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm one of a number of funders who generously helped us do this work. Um, and then the audience, I've looked a little bit at who's here from all walks of life and bringing your own energy and commitment. And our goal in this forum was to have a mix of people who come from a criminal justice perspective, from employment, from education, from a broader commitment to youth of color, and we think you're all in the room and on the web, and we thank you. Why? What is it that drew you? Well, I'll be interested in your answers, but my answer, why I felt so strongly about this forum, is that this is a crucial issue and it's a moment of opportunity. And I was just talking to Linda Harris, who really created this work at CLASP right before we began, and she said, you know, the work we do today and going forward will seed opportunities for more change throughout this administration and the next one at the national level as well as at the local level. And I guess I wanted to say, so the issue is crucial, uh, and Keisha talked about that, because, because of its impact on so many people's lives, the lives of so many youth of color. And a whole host of tragedies in the past couple of years have forced all Americans to understand what youth of color and communities of color always understood, which was that reforming the, the justice system is crucial to an opportunity for success for all young people. But I guess what I want to highlight is that this agenda is crucial not only for individuals, not only for young men and women, their children, their communities, but also for the success of America as a whole. And when you look at the numbers, and some of those are in the terrific class paper that I hope you had the chance to, to pick up, when you look at the numbers and you think about youth and young adults and that cohort, it's only going to be a few years that half of that youth and young adult cohort is youth of color. Right now it's 43, 44 percent. So there's no way that America can succeed going forward with an aging labor force unless today's young people of color are not only able to succeed, but able to thrive and lead in school, in work, and in their whole lives. And there's been just extraordinary energy and organizing already, but the opening those doors, tearing apart systems that are failing is crucial not only individually as a matter of fairness or compassion, but as a matter of America's future success. So the issue is crucial, and this is a moment of extraordinary opportunity. Part of that, which many of you know better than I do, is the organizing by youth and young adults themselves and by others around criminal justice reform. And part of it is energy at the same time on the economic justice front. You've heard Keisha say that the perspective we bring at CLASP is that in order to realize the opportunity of criminal justice reform, we also need to connect to school, education, and career opportunities. And we think there's energy on that economic justice front as well. Some of it, field organizing, fight for 15, um, out in, among people in communities, and some of it way more practical and wonky. Part of what we do at CLASP is look for opportunities to move specific policies, specific legislation, specific federal funding streams. So it's that intersection of the opportunities to reform criminal justice and the opportunities to reform economic justice, reform workforce, career, education, that's really what this forum is about. One moment just on why CLASP and on our role, and then I'll close. We're, a, for those of you who don't know us well, we're almost, we have a history of almost 50 years as advocates, a voice for the voiceless. More than 30 years of that has been very specifically with an anti-poverty lens. And about the last half of that, under the leadership of Linda Harris, um, of Alan Hausman, our prior director, really honed in on youth of color, disconnected youth as one of our array of topics, and also on deepening our racial equity lens across all of our work, so that we're thinking very consciously about what are the barriers that people of color face, low-income people of color, not only because of income, but also because of race and ethnicity. 
as you heard from Keisha, see, she said all our panels will be solution focused. At the core of CLASP's work is that we believe in solutions. We believe not just in identifying problems, but in fixing them. And we believe that the way we help is by bringing our expertise to bear in a partnership with other experts. So we're not the experts on sentencing reform, on policing reform, but we think that what we have to bring in terms of our expertise on youth who become disconnected in school and how to change that, on work, on career pathways, on careers, that we want to bring that to a connection with other kinds of expertise and weave those together into solutions. That's who we are. We believe in digging deep to find practical ways of taking big ideas like holistic and integration into real life solutions. And we also believe in stepping back and being bold and thinking of big picture ideas that set a high bar for investment and policy um, at the national level. So we think there's an extraordinary opportunity to take this conversation forward. And I, for one, am tremendously excited about what I'll learn from today and what it will seed for the future. And with that, let me introduce our next speaker, um, Anthony Smith, the Executive Director of Cities United, an extraordinary partner who was a terrific panelist in last year's forum and who personally exemplifies that connection between the practical work at the local level and the national vision. Anthony. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome uh, thank you all for taking the time out to come and have this important conversation with us uh, about our young people who really need us to be working hard every day to helping them figure out solutions. And we need to be doing that in partnership with them, not just for them, but they need to be a part of this conversation with us every day. Uh, as Olivia said, I am Anthony Smith. I'm the Executive Director of Cities United. And Cities United is a network of mayors, about 84 mayors right now and growing, working across the country to help mayors and communities uh, reduce homicides of African-American men and boys. Our mission is real clear. We want to reduce the number of homicides by 50% by the year 2025, and doing that by working with mayors across this country and really helping them design solutions and strategies that will engage young men of color and young black men and boys and help them help us find the solutions to solve this problem. We believe this is one of our most pressing problems in our country. If you look around the country every day, when we started in 2011, we lost 14 young men every day to homicides. So that's every day you wake up and you look at the news, 14 young men did not wake up with you that day. And most of those young men are between the ages of 10 and 24. So they fit this age group when we start talking about opportunity youth. And one of the things I love about this conversation is we can talk about youth of color, but we also got to get kind of specific around what does that mean for each of those subgroups, right? Because we cannot do a one size fit all program and solutions to this work. We've got to think about all of our young people, what they need, what they go through, and how we help them design solutions to create the lives that they want. And uh, one of our main things at Cities United is we need to keep you alive long enough for you to realize what your dream and what your vision is. So we work with mayors, uh, and I'm glad to see Mary Freeman Wilson here today. She's one of our leaders with Cities United. And we work across this uh, country really looking at place-based work, but also looking at solutions on the federal level and strategies. Uh, so we work real close with Roy Austin and the team and, uh, and the White House and the My Brother's Keepers Initiative, really trying to figure out how do we all come together to find these solutions. So Cities United is proud to be a partner. We are glad to be here. and We'll continue to be here when we have these conversations. We know uh, that we see young black men as assets and as valuable to this community. And we want to make sure that we change the conversation around how we think about and look at our young black men and boys and understand that they're, they are our assets to us. They're valuable and they're going to help their communities be better. But they've got to be at the table when we're having these conversations and we can no longer continue to uh, uh, create the same solutions and expecting a different outcome. So once again, we're thankful to be partners with CLASP and also with the Executive Alliance. Uh, we know that you can't get this work done alone. Uh, as uh, Olivia said, I used to work for Mayor Fisher in Louisville, uh, and we, I started my work as a community organizer on the ground, really recruiting young folks for, uh, for, or, for programmatic stuff. But I think as we continue to grow and we continue to uh, move this work, there's national work that needs to be done while we're also thinking about local work. Uh, the last thing I'll say about Cities United, and the reason we start with mayors is because we see them as CEOs of their cities. They have access to budgets. 
They have access to policy and they can influence that. And one of the things mayors all across this country do is they have a convening table where they can bring tons of people together to think about these ideas and solutions together. Uh, so mayors have been really important for us, but we do push them to be real clear that we do not just want you at the table with other leaders in your community if you're not bringing young people at the table. So we need to make sure we're consistently making space for young people. So looking forward to a lively conversation. Uh, we've got tons of great people who are gonna be on panels to help us have this conversation and, uh, and uh, really push us forward. Uh, we want you all to hold us accountable uh, as we continue to have these conversations and move the work uh, because we know that's how we get there and how we move things forward. Uh, so now I'm gonna invite uh, the first speaker to really help us frame this conversation and really help us get moving and uh, help you all understand, especially from a federal landscape of uh, how we all work in partnership together and what this administration ha has done and doing all the way, how many days is it, Roy? 2.13, uh, up until the last day that they leave office of how they help us see some of this work and uh, be ready for whichever administration comes in and how we move forward. So first up for us is Roy Alston. Uh, Roy Austin is the Deputy Assistant to the President for the Office of Urban Affairs, Justice and Opportunity at the White House Domestic Policy Council. He has carried out a broad portfolio of responsibilities since his first year, from addressing 21st century policing, homelessness, foster care, looking at how we create more STEM opportunities for young people who are marginalized, uh, the expansion of the legal aid services, workers' rights, big data, and a variety of, another, not of issues that relate to the criminal, juvenile and criminal justice, including reentry, uh, looking at how do we f uh, create more opportunities for formerly incarcerated people, and also how do we support the children who uh, have parents who are incarcerated. Uh, Roy Austin has also uh, played an active role in advancing the My Brother's Keepers initiative, which engaged community leaders along the philanthropic organizations and business to build ladders to opportunities for boys and young men of color. And before assuming this responsibility at the White House, Roy served uh, for many years in the U.S. Department of Justice as a Deputy Assistant uh, Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division. Please welcome me, uh, please join me in welcoming Roy Austin. So for those of you who are having trouble um, distinguishing between me and Anthony, uh, he has more salt in his goatee than pepper. Uh, I still have a little bit of pepper left. So if you're having any trouble distinguishing the two of us. Um, so as he said, we have, uh, as he noted, uh, we have 213 days left in this administration with um, someone who I uh, believe to be the greatest president that we have had in this country. Um, and I'm not biased in any way, shape, or form when I say that to you. And um, he, in a, in a speech uh, last year, took the criminal justice conversation and put it into three buckets. And what he said is those buckets are the courtroom, the cell block, and the community. And I have taken those three and, and kind of see them as uh, no entry, entry, and re-entry when we look at our justice system. So how do we keep people out of the justice system? What do we do with people when they are in the justice system? And what do we do for those who are justice involved when they come out? And since we have such limited time, what I need from you is for you to really take over the work that we've been doing for the last seven and a half years. I need you to take this work into your communities and make sure that it, it goes on, that it is sustained. Because regardless of who's president, we have problems that we're dealing with that are decades, if not centuries old, that we have to move forward to. So the easiest way to do this is just to give you a list. And so I am here, I know school's out for some, but for you it's just beginning. And so here's your homework assignment in 16 parts. <laughs> All right, so the first is school discipline. All right. Department of Education, Department of Justice created school discipline guidance, a document to give teachers the tools that they need to make sure the kids are not being sent into the juvenile justice system. We, we know for a fact that kids as young as four are being kicked out of school, being expelled, getting started on that spiral downward. So how do we make sure that schools do what we know that, uh, I believe it's Miami-Dade is doing right now, which is it is no longer going to expel kids or suspend, sorry, suspend kids out of school. 
meaning that the punishment for kids who are bad in school is going to be more school, which is exactly how it should be. So we need you to take that guidance, take it into your communities, and make sure that it's actually working and it's moving forward. So that's number one. Number two is jobs. All right, kids need jobs. And I mean, that's what CLASP talks about. That is how you have, uh, how you advance education and employment is you have to give them jobs. And it's not just about summer jobs. All of us are real good about saying, you know, let's get some kids some summer jobs. Let's get them playing a little midnight basketball. No, it's about real jobs. It's about real jobs with real skills. It's about apprenticeships. It's about giving them skills where they can actually get a job in the future. So what are we doing in our communities to make sure that we're giving kids real jobs, real opportunities to succeed? Number three is recognizing the sexual abuse to prison pipeline. We see that girls, and especially girls of color, are the largest growth area for incarceration right now in our system. We need to end that. And part of ending that is recognizing that so many of the young women who end up in the criminal justice system and the women who end up in the criminal justice system are there because they are, in fact, victims of some kind of sexual abuse. So how do we end that? How do we treat victims like victims? How do we make sure that we are not punishing people for being victims. And so getting girls and women out of the system is going to be a huge way for us to reduce the number of girls and women in our criminal justice system. So number, uh, I believe it is four, is alternatives to incarceration. So we've seen an enormous decrease in the number of juveniles who are currently incarcerated, approximately 50% over the last 10 years. We can make it even lower. We can get even more juveniles out of our justice system. And so we need to look for these alternatives. We need to keep them close to home. We need to make sure that their parents have the tools to deal with them or their guardians have the tools to deal with them. So what are these alternatives and how do we build on those and how do we make them even better? Number five is raise the age. All right, we've seen South Carolina and Louisiana, their governor signed in the past couple of weeks legislation that is making 18 the age, all right? of adulthood. That is a big deal. We only have seven states now that need to get it right. Only seven states. And treating young people like young people, understanding that they're going to make mistakes. So we need to drive these other states over the finish line. And we know that states like New York and Texas are really having this conversation. We need to help to drive them over the finish line because it is crazy that we are still treating 16 and 17 year olds as adults. We know for a fact that they are not there yet. With that comes, so number six is just the brain science, okay? We know, we know from our own lives that kids as young as 24, and I, and I know there are a bunch of interns in this, in this room right now who know what it means to be 24 or younger. Um, I remember what it was to be 24 and younger. You do some dumb things, all right? Doing a dumb thing does not mean that you need to be incarcerated, okay? Doing a dumb thing means you need help so that you can set yourself right. We need to look at what Connecticut recently tried to do, pushing the age up to 24. That's why My Brother's Keeper talks about kids from cradle all the way to 24 years old. The brain science tells us that that is an age of opportunity, an age where there's a chance to set yourself right, an age where you shouldn't be locked up for the rest of your life for every offense, because there is a chance that when you get to 25, you're gonna be a much different person. How do I give you the tools to become a better person? How do we look at what Connecticut tried to do and make sure that other states are looking at something very similar? So number uh, seven is trauma. So, so many of our young people who are in the system have dealt with violence and the trauma that comes from violence. How do we take a real close look at that? And I t tell you next week, the 27th through the 29th in Baltimore, the Forum on Youth Violence Prevention is going to be holding a, a multi-day se multi sessions to talk about ways to get kids, uh, give them the resilience to deal with the violence, and how do we work on ending the violence. They see domestic violence, they see violence in their schools, they see friends and other kids being shot and killed. This impacts kids, this impacts adults, but it especially impacts kids. So what can we do to make sure that we're dealing with that impact, dealing with that trauma, and making sure that they're in a better place? Now, number eight is, uh, is procedural justice. This is the task force on 21st century policing. This is the idea that kids these days recognize that our justice system is not exactly fair. If they don't think their justice system is fair, they're not gonna behave in a way that trusts that system. They're not gonna go to the police when they need help. They're gonna battle back against the police instead of understanding that the police 
are parts of the community and people who they should be working with. How do we create that in policing? Well, we have the Task Force on 21st Century Policing Recommendations. Again, this is something, this is your homework. Take that task force report, take it into your communities, and make change with it. There are 59 recommendations in there. Take those recommendations, ask your police chief, ask your mayor, what are you doing to implement these recommendations to making sure that they're everywhere in the country? This is all about making sure also that young people have a seat at the table. Okay, we can't ignore young people. We absolutely have to give them a seat at the table, give them an opportunity to tell us what it is that they need, what it is that they want, because this really is their world, and we have to make sure that we're putting them in that place. So that's the whole no entry bucket. On the entry bucket, Department of Education created the Correctional Educational Guidance. If you have a young person who is locked up, you need to provide them with the education that they need to succeed. There's no other choice. It makes no sense to do anything else. It makes no sense to not do anything and then talk about recidivism rates and complain. Because if you haven't given them a chance in an education while they are incarcerated, while they are detained, then you're wasting time. And you're, you're just basically creating the, the situation, the environment that we have right now where we have recidivism rates in the 60s, 60% 60 from state and local facilities. We have to do better. And then the second piece of that, and this is number 10, is skills. So when a young person is locked up, what skills are you giving them? Not just educational skills, what job skills? We know, every, you, you, we can do 20 more reports on this, that a job is one of the best ways to reduce recidivism, to give someone hope. So what are we doing there? What, are, what is the work that we are giving these young people while they are incarcerated? What are the skills that we are giving them so that they can be successful when they come out? And then let's talk about the re-entry side. So very soon, number 11, very soon, I think you're going to be hearing from the Department of Education on the Second Ch Chance Pell program. This is the opportunity for young people to, while they are incarcerated, get the help they need so that they have the education on the way out so that they can re-enter uh, properly. We had over 200, over 200 uh, uh, jurisdictions say that they wanted to join this program. That's enormous. And we're still getting pushback from Congress saying, you know, why are you providing an education to these criminals? Well, unfortunately, about 70, there are about 70 million criminals now in this, uh, in this country, about a third of our adult population. So we need to be providing education because we have no choice any further, anymore. Number 12 is the Fair Chance Hiring Pledge. So we've gotten over 120 businesses to sign on to say that they are going to ban the box with their individual businesses. So the president has the federal government banning the box. We know that there are over 20 states who have banned the box. We need every business, every business to ban the box. And that doesn't mean that you have to hire everybody who walks through your doors. It means you have to give everybody an opportunity to prove themselves. And if they prove that they can be that best employee, why wouldn't you give them a job? Absolutely, why wouldn't you give that person the job? So how do we expand the fair chance hiring? Again, this is homework that you can do in your communities. You go into your communities, you ask your businesses, you ask your chamber of commerce, why haven't we banned the box? Because there are too many incredibly talented young people out there who have some kind of justice involvement who need this opportunity and who will end up being, like Johns Hopkins Medical Center says, your absolute best employees. So similarly, and number 13, is fair chance secondary education. So the Department of Education just released guidance on beyond the box. How do we look beyond the box in secondary education? We know NYU has pushed back on the idea that they need to ask at the initial application stage what a person's justice involvement is. We know if we look across states um, that we see very uneven disciplinary policies. We know that it impacts young black boys and young brown boys more than anybody else. So how do we make sure that educational systems, that our higher educational systems, are giving young people a chance to prove that they can come to that school and do well? Well, that is getting them to sign on to this Fair Chance second, um, Secondary Education Pledge. Every school should do it. We have over 25 that have already signed up around the country. The entire, I believe it's the entire UC system is one of them. Uh, CUNY system out of New York is another of them. This is important. This is stuff that is going to change people's lives and give them real hope. Number uh, 14 is occupational licensing. So we have all these rules that are locking people, knocking people out of the 
uh, job market because, because they were just as involved, they can't have a job or have a certain job. Well, that has, just because you have a record does not mean you can't do the work. And again, let's get rid of these overly broad uh, occupational licensing requirements. You know, if I, if I want to choose someone for a particular job, I can do so by certification, okay? But let's not lock people out completely because I bet you there are some amazing people out there who simply can't get licensed. And if we look across the country, we have these random licenses requiring, you know, months to get a license to do a job that someone probably needs a couple hours or a couple weeks of training maximum. So let's look at those policies and, and, and let's work to change those policies. So number 15 is just the criminal justice legislation. So in October, in October of 2015, with a 15 to five vote, the United States Senate's passed the Sentencing Reform and Corrections Act of 2015. We are now in June and that hasn't moved. And part of that legislation is reforming mandatory minimums and part of it is uh, giving judges more discretion and part of it is giving more funding to reentry. But another big piece of this, and this is something that Senator Booker pushed really hard for, is getting rid of the use of juvenile solitary confinement, giving juveniles a chance to expunge their records, and making sure that there is a creation of some kind of juvenile parole to help young people who are incarcerated. And that's on the federal system. And we know that states like Georgia and Texas and Connecticut have done amazing work on this. Why is it that as a federal government we can't? We need to keep having the conversation about the need for federal legislation so that the federal government is the gold standard on how we do justice in this country. And the way to do this is through legislation. The president has done pretty much everything that he can do and he's gonna continue to do it for the remaining days in office. But how do we make sure that we get this legislation over the finish line before this president is out of office? Because there are thousands of people who will be impacted and we need to find a way to do so. So your bonus is number 16. And this is where I kind of lead into um, the great work of, of Mayor Freeman Wilson. And that's the My Brother's Keeper initiative. So everything that I've said is part of My Brother's Keeper. And what My Brother's Keeper is more than anything else is come up with a plan. This stuff isn't gonna happen alone. Come up with a silo free plan for how it is your community is going to address the problems that it has. Gary, Indiana is doing it. 200 other communities are doing it. So come up with a plan and then do it. Okay, it's nice to have a plan. It's nice to, you know, we, we have the plans online. You can take a look at them. But then you, the people, the community, have to be the ones to force them to do it and hold them accountable. So go where the data leads, be evidence-based, be data-driven, but come up with a plan. And My Brother's Keeper, the, the uh, My Brother's Keeper Alliance, is gonna be on beyond this president. The president has made it clear that this work is going to be part of his life going forward. But this has, to be, this has to happen on the ground. It has to happen in the communities. The federal government is not gonna be able to fix every community that is out in this country. You have to do it. And so with that, welcome to summer. <laughs> Enjoy your homework. And I look forward to seeing the fruits of your labor. Thank you so much. So I hope everybody got their 16 points uh, down because you cannot leave until you give those to us as part of your quiz that Roy talked about. Uh, but I thank you again, Roy, for bringing uh, those uh, great points. And that's a lot of resources that you all need to tap into as the federal government is helping us think things through. So I think if you don't have the, all those 16 points, please reach out to uh, Roy and his team to get those. Or you can probably find it all online at whitehouse.gov and to get that information as well. So next I'll get to bring up uh, Mayor uh, Karen Freeman Wilson. When I first met her three years ago, I knew she was a powerhouse and really about her business of Gary and uh, not just Gary, but the, uh, the country. Uh, but then I read her bio and I was like, okay, she's not playing around. She had been doing some amazing things. And I think, you know, when, when, you, uh, when you hear from her, you guys will see why we asked her to come. Uh, Cause when we were planning this, Keisha asked me, which one of the mayors in your network would you like to be here? And Mayor was at the top of my list and she said yes. And we were very excited that she said yes so we can, uh, we can go on and, and then think about the rest of the folks who were gonna be on the agenda with us. So, a little background. Mayor Freeman Wilson is the first female mayor of Gary, Indiana, and the first African-American female mayor in the state of Indiana. 
As the twice elected uh, Gary City judge, she helped pioneer the drug court movement in Indiana. In Indiana, she is the immediate past CEO of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals and Executive Director of the National Drug Court Institute, based here in D.C. Mayor Wilson, Freeman Wilson has consulted with the Office of White House Drug Control Policy, Department of Justice, and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in the creation and implementation of drug policies. During her tenure as the Indiana Attorney General, Mayor Freeman Wilson fought passionately on behalf of youth, seniors, and abused nursing home patients. While she was the Executive Director of the Indiana Civil Rights Commission, Indiana was the first state to pass legislation comparable to the Americans with uh, Disabilities Act. She is an honors graduate of Howard, of, uh, not Howard, Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson. Good afternoon. I want to thank uh, Anthony for letting everybody know that I can't keep a job. Uh, certainly to uh, Ms. Olivia Golden and uh, Keisha Bird and the class team, to Anthony and uh, my city's United colleagues, and to all of you, especially uh, to my friend Roy Austin, whose work I, I greatly admire and, and appreciate as he provides a blueprint, not just for you all, he gives us homework as mayors as well, so don't feel bad. Um, you know, thank you for the invitation to join a room full of workers and not just talkers. Uh, you know, as kids, we used to say, talk is cheap, and that actions speak louder than words. And while the planning and the discussion and the thinking around this work is so key to getting it done, I'm just so glad that the people in this room don't just stop at the discussion. And so thank you for this invitation. And so when I, I thought about what I would share and even though I've got a new best friend and the timekeeper, I don't think that he's going to give me the latitude that he gave his boss. You know, I noticed he didn't even touch the time things when uh, Ms. Golden was up, but um, I'm just saying, I'm observing now. But um, I, I thought about, you know, what I could share with you, and uh, certainly you are going to talk and hear about juvenile incarceration, and you're going to hear about the impact of youth poverty, and you, you will talk about the importance of uh, out-of-school time and nutrition, and all of those things which are extremely important. But I thought it was really key for me to give you what we as mayors can do to make this work relevant and to continue what President Obama has um, deemed and made important during the course of his administration. And so what I wanted to do is make the case for mayors to be deeply involved in this work and then to suggest some ways that we could get, can get it done. Um, I would suggest to you that as mayors, it is our job to make this a priority. Now, what do I mean by that? The reality is that as mayors, we are firefighters. We are crisis managers. On any given day, there are 10 things that most people would deem very, 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 very important. And we have to do them all at the same time. But I would suggest to you that the justice and the achievement and the opportunity 
for youth in each and every one of our communities has to be a priority. Recently, uh, in Governing Ma Magazine, Mark Funkhauser, the former mayor of Kansas City, Missouri, and um, in analyzing or at least um, reviewing a book by the former mayor of uh, Minneapolis, R.T. Ryback, indicated that mayors, as mayors, our most important job is to build community. And I would interpret building community is creating opportunities for every individual in the community. Now, some mayors look at that as bricks and mortar, developing the airport, developing the downtown, creating jobs, raising the AV, development. And that's important. But as the mayor of Gary, I would suggest to you that it does me very little to create a job in my city if I don't have a school system that prepares young people who live in my community to take the job that I'm creating. It does very little for me as mayor to raise the income of Gary residents if I never think about or address income inequality. And it certainly does me little to create opportunities to expand the airport, to do those things that as mayors around the country, we all do. If the residents, or at least the children of the residents who work for me or who voted for me are either engaged in the juvenile justice system, are being treated unfairly by the police, or are in some way disadvantaged by the opportunities that I am supposed to create. And so I have to make this as much of a priority as all of those other things because I understand that it is my responsibility. If I'm going to be a community builder, then I have to build every aspect of the community. So how does that happen? How do I get that done? Well, let me suggest a few ways that as mayors, we make that happen. If it's a priority, then we have to devote the necessary time. I can't say one thing and do another. And so when I'm invited to convene a meeting of potential employers for our summer jobs program, I can't just run in there and give the mayor a wave and leave, but I have to sit down and convey the message of why we require, why we need, why our young people need jobs and why it's just as much of an advantage for the employer as it is for the employee. I have to give my time for our national or our, our citywide mentoring program so that when we kick it off, that I'm not just there to provide the photo op or to simply say this is a good thing, but I have to explain why it's important for not just people who work in the community, for people who have made mentoring a priority, but why it's a important for me and my colleagues, for others who think that they're too busy to take the time and serve as mentors. And so I really have to make it a priority, but I have to allocate my time to demonstrate that it is a priority. Because if I do that, if I demonstrate it, then others in our administration, others in our community will make it a priority for themselves too. The second is to use the convening power of the office. And I'm not just saying to use it to call a meeting because you know that everybody will come, because they will. 
but to use the convening power of the mayor's office to have the right people at the table, to get the prosecutor and the U.S. attorney in the room, to get the judge in the room, even though he'll say, well, uh, as a part of my judicial canons, I can't talk about certain things. And I say, yes, I was a judge, I know, so you can't talk about the case, but we're not going to ask you about any cases. We want to ask you about the policy that you use to address those cases. You want to get people in the room who can fund the activities that need to be funded. You want to get community workers in the room, and by all means, the first people that you want to call to the table are the young people who will be implant impacted by the planning and the work than you, that you do. There is nothing like planning a party for somebody, and it's all wrong. You know, as a kid, I have to tell you this. My mother used to give me birthday parties, and you know, even when we didn't have a party, there was always ice cream and cake. From the time that I was five, I know at least until the time that I was 13, and you know, I, my protest just got so strong, she would order a lemon tort cake. I hate lemon tort cake, <laughs> but that was the kind of cake that she liked. And so as those who are planning, who are working, we can't order lemon tort cake and think that somebody is going to enjoy it. That's why it's important to have young people at the table. And then as conveners, you have to be willing to not only set the table, but to initiate the conversations that need to be had and are often very difficult for those who are at the table conversations about race, conversations about disparities, conversations about trauma and the impact of trauma on people who don't even think about things like this because they've never seen it, they've never had it in their lives before. You have to be willing to have conversations and lead conversations that make people uncomfortable because ultimately it will inform the work that has to be done. You have to have, be willing as the mayor to address issues like what your police force is doing and if they're doing the right thing or if they're doing some things that require challenge or require training and require change. You have to be willing to lead that change, and that, trust me, is a very difficult conversation. You also have to be willing to think about those things and suggest those issues that may seem minuscule to most of your residents, but really, really, really matter, like banning the box. In Gary, we banned the box, but we also encourage those who contract with the city, those who have city contracts, to ban the box as well. But something that we rarely talk about and think about, you know, we have driver's licenses, but there are people who long before they even qualify to get driver's licenses or since they got their driver's licenses, got tickets and now they can't get a valid license. And how many of us know that many, many, many jobs require what? A valid driver's license. So I tell you what we did in the city of Gary, and I actually do it because I know a little bit about how to get it done. In our law department, we clean up licenses for citizens in our community. And what I mean by that is, we review their driving records, we work with the prosecutor's office to correct any problems and to minimize the fines so that they can get valid licenses which will lead them to getting employment ultimately. But I would say to you as mayors, in addition 
in addition to advantaging the relationships that we have, we have to lead by example. I gave you some examples of that regarding our summer jobs, regarding our banning the boxes, regarding the importance of mentoring. But I want to be even more concrete than that. About um, 15 years ago, we lived next door to uh, a family, a grandmother, who was raising her six grandchildren. And during her senior year, one of her granddaughters uh, became a little unruly. In fact, she got pretty unruly. And her grandmother put her out. Well, she was in her senior year of high school, just about to graduate, and she had nowhere to live. And she came to live with us. Now, at that time, I had a 10-year-old and a very impressionable 10-year-old. And so what we did, my husband and I, we set some parameters and said, you know, this is what you have to do. All you have to do is go to, go to school, keep the kitchen clean, and we'll do the rest. And for the first time in 12 years of school, not only did that young woman graduate, but she graduated and made the honor roll for the first time in all of 12 years. But beyond that, beyond that, every day there is an opportunity for us to provide opportunities for not just individuals, but whole parts of our communities by setting policy and the policy that we set as mayors. And whether we're setting policies in our summer youth programs or whether we're setting policies that impact the criminal justice system, we have to be willing to think about the decisions that we make and the impact that we have on all of the young people, many of whom we may never see in the mayor's office. There's so many things that pull on us on a daily basis. And uh, I know it because it happens to me every day. What we have to ultimately understand that the work that we do for young people, the work that we do to not just impact the justice system, because if we wait to impact the justice system, then we have waited too late. The work that we do to keep young people out of the justice system is an investment. And I would suggest to you that it is just as important an investment as the one that I make in the airport, in the lakefront, and all of the other places in the city of Gary. Because ultimately, by investing in young people, we are investing in our future. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. Um, so thank you so much, Mayor Freeman Wilson. That was fantastic. And I, as a native of Indianapolis, Indiana, I'm feeling very proud in this moment. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon to you all, and thank you so much for being here. I am thrilled to be serving as your moderator. Um, I am not Enchanta. I'm sorry, you are stuck with me. I am Allison Brown. I am the executive director of the Communities for Just Schools Fund based here in Washington, D.C. And we are a donor collaborative that supports organizing, grassroots organizing that's working for equity in education uh, and healthy school climate, pushing back against the school to prison pipeline and more. And I'm so thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, and I'm thrilled to introduce our fantastic panel. Um, so before we get into uh, introductions, just a couple of of notes. The first is that, you know, this has been a very difficult week for us as a nation. Um, we experienced Orlando, Florida, uh, and the, the 49 people who were massacred uh, in a nightclub there in Orlando. 
uh, we uh, commemorated the one year anniversary of the massacre of parishioners who were worshiping in their church, nine people who were killed uh, in the practice of their worship. Uh, and we also celebrated Juneteenth yesterday, which is about freedom and liberation and was uh, a new chapter on a fight for freedom and liberation. So that work, as we know, is not done. Uh, we still have a tremendous amount to do, and I am proud to be doing that work with you all and with the wonderful people that I will introduce right now. Um, so first we have Morningstar Gali, who is the Assistant Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and Cultural Information Officer for the Pitt River Tribe in Bernie, California. Morningstar, join us. And welcome. Erin Kirkland is a PowerCorps PHI and AmeriCorps alum. He also now works with the city of Philadelphia in the Philadelphia Water Department. Welcome, Erin. Amanda Matos is founder and executive director of the Womanhood Project. She's also co-chair of the Young Women's Advisory Council for the Young Women's Initiative in New York City. Welcome, Amanda. <laughs> and Judge Stephen Teske is the chief judge of the juvenile court in Clayton County, Georgia, and has done some really tremendous work around young people that we will hear about today. Welcome, Judge Teske. <laughs> So we are, um, we are live streaming, and so welcome to those of you who are joining us also uh, by webcast. And if you are tweeting, make sure that you are using the hashtags UnrealizedJustice and RealizedYouthJustice. Um, we are uh, going to be taking questions as soon as we've had some conversation with the panel. Uh, and so the, for those of you who are here with us in the room, write your questions on the index card that is in your folder and there will be staff, class staff, who are circulating to take those questions from you. And if you are joining online, email your questions to events at class.org. Uh, so with that, I'll start with a question, one question to all of you. To start with your personal experiences, share your personal experiences and how uh, your story brought you to the work that you do. Judge, Judge Teske, we'll start with you. Well, Allison, uh, I, I've been on the bench since 1999, and uh, I think it's important to let you know uh, if you've flown into the world's busiest airport, because it's the world's busiest airport, most of the folks in here have flown into it, uh, Atlanta, uh, you're in my county, okay? And uh, when I took the bench in 1999, uh, my county was majority white, but I was quite frankly disturbed when I took the bench and saw the disproportionate number of kids of color that were being arrested. Um, and so with that, uh, I, uh, I took it upon myself uh, to initiate uh, using my judicial authority uh, to convene, as the mayor said, use, using my inherent convening authority, brought everyone together to start having a conversation around what we're doing to ourselves in our county. In fact, the more kids that we detain, the more kids we arrested on school campus, our graduation rates plummeted to an all-time low uh, by 2004 at 58 percent. Um, and what we realize is that uh, what has been known traditionally as the conservative thing to do to get tough by using smart punishing was in fact not the smartest thing to do. And so uh, we had to reframe uh, the way that we approached juvenile justice in our county and so at the same time we had to retool ourselves. So let me just say this that that you know for me uh, I have to credit my personal experiences growing up around a lot of diversity, mostly my parents, okay? And it, it was, when I confronted that situation in Clayton County when I became a judge, I knew that I just couldn't be part of that system. It was immoral. 
quite frankly, was illegal. And let me just say this as I close, that uh, when, when I started as a judge, our average daily detention population in, in our county was 72, sometimes reaching over 100 kids. Today, it's only 12, okay? Um, we, when we placed SROs in schools as part of the zero tolerance system the year before, we only had 49 arrests. By 2004, there were over 1,200. Uh, now those arrests are down 91%, okay? Um, and, and at the same time, um, you know, as I said, our graduation rates were falling. There was a correlation between the two because as goes graduation, so goes crime. Our juvenile crime rate had increased dramatically. And, and as I mentioned, I decided that most of these, well, first of all, most of these kids that were being detained, arrested at school were kids of color by far, okay? And, uh, and so at the same time as uh, Mr. Austin was saying earlier and mentioning the 16 points and the buckets there, the three buckets, and um, he's absolutely correct. We had to hit not only diverting these kids and setting up systems like the first school justice partnership in the country that reduced these school arrests, but even at the other end, creating a deep, the, a deep end court and keeping kids from who were eligible to, uh, matter of fact, they were, some, but for the programs, they would be in prison. And I wanna say this, in Georgia, when we send a kid to a youth prison, of all kids we send, 65% reoffend when they get out. Yet, in this, in, in our system locally, in the second chance program for deep end kids, all right, who would be in prison, we've kept them in the community using evidence-based programs like Mr. Austin stated, with only a 6% reoffense rate, okay? In other words, had I sent all those kids to prison, okay, Imagine how, think of it, that many more victims there would be in our community when they got out. And that's smart on crime, okay? So I just wanna end with that, and except for one thing, our juvenile crime rate is down 71%. Thank you, thank you, Judge Chesney. <laughs> Amanda? Uh, does this work, can y'all hear me? Do y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, um, my name is Amanda Matos. Um, I come into this space carrying my identities as a feminist, as a womanist, as a young Latina, as a Puerto Rican woman, and someone from the Bronx, New York. <laughs> Just wanted to let you know that. Um, and I wanna share with y'all that growing up, my role model, just don't make fun of me, okay? My role model was JLo. Um, I'm not a singer or dancer at all. Um, I put my family to shame, even though I'm Puerto Rican. <laughs> Um, but she was my role model, honestly, and she still is, because growing up, she was the only public figure I saw who shared my identity as a Puerto Rican woman from the Bronx. Um, growing up in the Bronx, everything um, seemed great to me, right? Um, majority are folks of color. Majority come from a lower middle class to low income background. To me, everyone was the same, and I didn't know anything different. However, then, in 2009, um, at a young age of 17, my life changed, right? 17 years old. Um, 17 was the year that I realized that in order to go to college, I had to figure out my own expenses. My family would not be able to afford to send me to a university or to a local college, but I knew I had something in me that I wanted to go to the best university that I could go to. So 2008 was when I applied to college. Um, did some of that really on my own. Didn't have the extra resources to provide the supports for me to navigate that system, navigate FAFSA or the application process. Um, a few months later, 2009 is the year I credit to really being a turning point. 2009 was when I was graduating from high school. It was also the same year I remember so vividly um, on the car radio hearing Obama's voice saying he was nominating Sonia Sotomayor to the Supreme Court. So I was like, yes, another role model. She's Puerto Rican and from the Bronx. Um, and not a dancer or a singer. Um, and then it was also the same year I got into Columbia on a full financial scholarship to the best university that I wanted. Um, thanks. But wait, there's more. Um, and then it wasn't until really I got into Columbia and then I was in the classroom space and I was meeting so many other people that I realized, oh wow, 
Um, I didn't grow up with all of these resources as my classmates. I didn't have these experiences or this access to education um, that as my classmates. And that was a key moment where I realized I was living in a bubble that while growing up it seemed normal, it seemed great, it was a moment that I realized, wait, I deserve more and I could have been having more. And so many other people who are not even at Columbia deserve and should have more. Um, and so that really led me to finding my own, um, my own spirit of activism and grassroots organizing. Because going to Columbia, I felt pretty icky with the privilege I was gaining then. And so I really had to think carefully, um, me a Bronx girl going to Columbia, what does that really mean? What can I do with this new privilege I have? And so I organized in my own community and created an organization where we see young girls of color as the solutions to the problems. And so we're the Womanhood Project and we're a mentorship program for young girls of color run by young girls of color. Again, because role modelship was so important to me, only having two public figures, I wanna change and transform that. And really that led me into now being involved with New York City Council, which again, five, 10, 15 years ago, I would have never imagined that. And now I'm part of history. New York City recognizing that my brother's keeper is so incredible, addressing the barriers that young men of color are facing. We decided that we need to do more because what about the young girls of color? We're in the same neighborhoods, the same under-resourced neighborhoods. Um, we are experiencing similar situations to our brothers, yet we're being erased and ignored because oftentimes gender focuses on white women and race focuses on men of color. So we're left out. And so now I'm part of the Young Women's Initiative where we have an advisory council of young women of color who are working with policymakers, philanthropists, direct service providers, advising our city on how to make it a better place for all of us and, not making, and making sure that we're visible and that we are strong. And so that's why I'm here today and that's really my entry point into this world of policy and youth activism. Thank you so much, Amanda. So I, I already have so many thoughts and questions, but I know uh, Keisha will keep me on task. <laughs> um, so with that, Aaron, will you talk about your personal experiences? Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, well, I just want to say I'm honored to be here to be a part of this conversation and all the good work we all are doing. Uh, I grew up in West Philadelphia uh, to a single parent mother, middle of three. Um, in my neighborhood, I began to hang around crowds that were negatively af affected by our communities, and in return, I was swept up in that negativity. Um, this landed me into a mentality of crime and criminal acts, which eventually landed me into the penitentiary at the age of 20. Um, I was sentenced to five years five to 10 years, and I ended up serving the five. I'm currently on parole. Uh, while incarcerated, uh, I sought change. Uh, being in and out of solitary confinement, different altercations. Uh, one specifically was May 2011, Mother's Day. I got into this real bad altercation where I almost lost my life. And I had an opportunity to use the phone to call my mother. When I called her, I uh, explained to her that she wouldn't hear from me for a while, that I would be in solitary confinement again. And she explained to me, she said, she, this is what she told me, she said, Aaron, you're so concerned about what's going on in prison, you should be concerned about what's going on out here. You got a family that love you and care about you. And I took that with me, that was the last time I went to the hole. While, while I was in solitary confinement, her words just, I just began to think about all the things she had taught me, all the seeds she had planted. One was, she always wrote on the back of her letters was, if you spill a glass of milk, clean it up and get another glass. So uh, eventually, I was released from solitary confinement and put back in the population with the other inmates. Uh, I wanted to change, but I didn't know what aspects of myself that I had to work on in order to come back to society as a normal citizen. So what I, what I began to read books and work out and get a regiment of you know, positivity, it seemed like people that was like-minded began to draw to me. One in particular, his name was Ricky Brown. He was a lifer, and he walked up to me and he said, Aaron, he said, prison could either be the playground for the fools or the university for the wise is what you make it. And he began to direct me into certain books, and I told him I wanted to go back to school when I was released. He helped me find GED books. He helped me with my math. 
things that I had failed at prior to my incarceration. Um, given these new tools I was equipped with, I wanted to implement everything I had learned when I was released, when I was released in September 2014. And I still remember the day when my mother was right there crying, I'm crying, and she brought me in and embraced me. But I still, I still wanted this change to be real. So uh, I began looking for employment right away, and there was a barrier there, and that was my background. Not only my background, but also the gap of my work history. So uh, I remember going to UPS and going on an interview, and everything went well. Out of 11 people, I was the only one that didn't get the job because of my background. But I didn't give up there because I had learned my lesson, I paid my debt, and I had hope. And uh, I heard about this program called Power Corps. It's a AmeriCorps program. AmeriCorps had been around for about 20 years, national service. Um, and they told me that I had fit the criteria of the age bracket and the background in which I could serve my community and gain uh, work history in the green field. So I did um, green stormwater management. It was a six month program and I did 1,100 hours of community service. Um, given this opportunity, other opportunities began to open up for me. One was my city, Philadelphia, is an equal opportunity city. So they told me about a job opportunity with the Philadelphia Water Department. So I interviewed for it, and I ended up getting the job, which I'm currently employed. But I didn't want to stop there. I wanted to go back to school. You know, I wanted to do better. And I went back to school for environmental science, which I'm currently taking evening courses. But it wasn't just, I didn't want to just stop there. I felt like I had an obligation to give back to my community too, my peers that I had left behind. Uh, at first I was gung-ho, just telling them like all the things they were doing was wrong, we got to change. It wasn't trying to hear it. So I had to be an example. And every day they see me come home from work, come home from school. They see my life progress. I was the billboard of what reentry can be when you have support. And your community not only forgives you, it gives you a true second chance. So that's why I'm here today. Thank you, Aaron. Morningstar. Kimi Sanwe, Morningstar Gali, Ilaka Atake Chi'i, Ma Ajimawi is Chi'i. My name is Morningstar Gali. I work as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer um, for my tribe back home, which is in Northeastern California, the Pitt River Tribe. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of this land, the Piscataway peoples, and Chief Billy Tayek for his, his leadership um, here in the tribal area. Um, my involvement in, in the work that I, I do now, it's the name of the project is Restoring Justice for Indigenous Peoples, and we're working to um, decriminalize Indian country, working to end mass incarceration and the over-representation of Native peoples throughout Turtle Island. I became involved in it through, um, through my father. My father was incarcerated at San Quentin um, for over seven years, and it was an amazing woman um, by the name of Wilma Mankiller, who was the, who went on to become the first female principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, um, who was working with our tribe at the time and working with my father and had worked to um, help get him released. He was able to walk out of San Quentin and walk back in at a time that that, um, still at a time that that's not possible. He was able to walk in as a volunteer um, to support the religious services and through the American Indian um, Freedom of Religion Act, which up until 1978, it was illegal to, be, to practice our, our traditional and cultural ways. Um, they had to go underground and, and many Native people were prosecuted up until the late 1970s. I um, helped my father in the prisons, helped gather the medicines that were needed, went into the powwows um, and just really spent my life um, as a young person doing that up until he passed away at the age of 13, um, as many young people go, you know, off track and are trying to, you know, find themselves. I, um, this was in 1993, when the zero tolerance policies um, were beginning in the school systems and I was expelled from Oakland Unified Public School District. Um, 
and sent to juvenile hall at that time. My parents were told that I wasn't going to be able to t attend any public school within Northern California or throughout the state of California actually at that time, um, for which was really a minor, minor suspension, should have been a minor suspension. And um, that put me on track to becoming a statistic where I did become one of the 50% of native youth that do not graduate from high school. Um, I did event, so I started working, I actually tested out with the California High School Proficiency, um, obtained my GAED, and went on to attend Mills College. While attending college, I was volunteering at the nearby federal women's facility, um, and it was really difficult for me. It was difficult to be um, in a place, a, a, a private women's college, where there were not familiar faces on campus. There was less than a handful of Native women there, yet I went into um, the federal facility every weekend to both the camp and the main line, and, um, and there was an overrepresentation. There were so many familiar faces, and I was able to walk out of there, but they weren't. And just the fact that, you know, the slight decision, the slight turn of the dial that I made, um, or didn't make, you know, in terms of their charges and, and the sentences that they received, um, I really knew that. I, I needed to do something, I needed to be able to, to use, use my privilege and voice to be able to support those sisters inside and our brothers that are inside. And so I went back home. I've been working for my tribe for four and a half years now. Um, but every day, it's the reality. Our, our recidivism rate um, for Native peoples in California is 69.9%. And if anyone has any question as to why it's so high, I see it on a daily basis. I see um, you know, people coming in every day, tribal members that are looking for work um, because of issues with you know, not having a driver's license because they were incarcerated and not able to pay their child support, which then in turn, they receive a suspension on their license. They, can't, you know, they don't have access to employment or those resources that are needed. Um, and so really that's my motivation um, for continuing on in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Morning Star. So Judge Teske, you really sit at the, um, really the fulcrum of the, in the justice system, you're really at the, the, the entry point, the exit point. Um, it's, a, it's a critical point of uh, interaction for young people of color with systems. Um, we think about school to prison pipeline and um, sexual abuse to prison pipeline and school to prison to deportation pipeline. The justice system is there and it's, a, it's omnipresent for young people of color. Um, I, I wonder if you would just talk, if we were to take a step back and think about what it would be, what it would look like to no longer criminalize young people, what would, what would the justice system then be? Allison, um, first of all, you know, the, the, the operative word is imagine. Okay, but I believe it can become reality, mm -hmm. all right? And, and I know that because we've been realizing that I, locally in Clayton County and now our governor in Georgia, Governor Deal, who's placed me on the Criminal Justice Reform Commission, we've been doing this for five years, has adopted many of our local policies and we are now seeing a dramatic you know, decline of kids in color being committed into the state system statewide. But what does it look like is, first of all, I think it takes two things. Number one is that we need to ensure that the people, the practitioners in juvenile justice are people who possess empathy, all right? And it begins with white folks. And, and I can say this because I remember in my, my parents' 25th wedding anniversary, we surprised them, and my sister and I went looking through the attic to find some, some stuff, some memorabilia, and we came across these letters. My father was traveling extensively, and he wrote to my mom every day, and we started going through those letters, of which most of them we couldn't read publicly. They, they all started, my dearest darling, but there was one letter that was written that said, my dearest darling, and the first sentence my dad wrote to my mom was this, today is truly the saddest day in our country's history for we have killed a great man. And that letter was dated April 4th, 1968. 
the day Martin Luther King was murdered. And that was a white man talking privately to his wife. That's who my father was. That's who my parents were. But despite all of that, I still have to guard against white privilege. Now, that's number one. The other one, Allison, is that we have to fix our system using practical, pragmatic approaches that are very deep and not superficial. And when I say that, that requires data analysis and asking the tough questions, including the white privilege question for practitioners. But lastly, um, I want to say this. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how much you care. I don't care how much you're like Steve Teske, who had parents who raised me to love everybody, okay, regardless of the color of their skin. But you know what? Even those people, like myself, who are working in a broken system will still make broken decisions. All right? And I'll end with this one last thing, Allison. I declared the shackling of kids in my courtroom as unconstitutional. Now, for all the reasons that it violates due process, including the trauma, using the same evidence-based stuff that the Supreme Court used in Roper and Miller decisions and removing life with, and, and removing execution of juveniles and life without uh, parole. But there's one other thing, and I'm going to leave you with this. I want you to be in my courtroom and visualize for just a moment, which is now, and uh, you know, our population is about 70%, if not more, African American. I want you to think about this, visualize this. Kids, a kid is marched, a black kid is marched into the courtroom by the deputy, shackled, hands out, waist chains around him. And in the back of the room, there's his mama, maybe his daddy sitting at the table and over there in the audience is his grandmama, maybe granddaddy, who used to see the white, whites only, who remember where they had to sit on the bus and they couldn't look at, in the eyes of a white person walking down the street. What do you think's going through their head when they see their black child shackled? What do you think that comes up within them? that white people tend not to think about because we didn't experience it. And I want you to shift from that black kid to the white man on the bench, the master. That's empathy. That's when we need to stop and start thinking about what other people are going through. What have they felt? What's in their history? that resonates in them and brings up those feelings. And that's another reason why I stop shackling of kids, especially kids of color. Thank you for, for centering us in history, Judge Teske, because I think that is so vitally important. And, and with that reminder, Morningstar, I wanted to ask you about what it is for Native communities, what are the things that make the interactions with the criminal justice system unique. And especially thinking about history, and I'm thinking of boarding schools and um, you know, all of the, the incredibly painful experiences that, that Native communities have experienced in this country. Sure, if, if we go back um, in history, the very first prisons for, for Native peoples were reservations that they were confined to, that they weren't able to leave to go gather their traditional food, that they weren't able to leave, um, to be able to go out and seek employment. They, you know, and, and in turn, the boarding schools, as you mentioned. So starting with the, you know, reservations and boarding schools where children were removed from their families at very young ages, and the parents didn't have the transportation, um, they didn't have, you know, the funds to be able to even visit their children. Um, where, you know, you saw that this is where um, we talk about the, the cycles of trauma that were acknowledged earlier, 
where that started, where, where children were, were beaten, they were sexually abused, um, you know, by the boarding school staff, by the, by the priests and nuns that were there. And um, there's, you know, just now that conversation is beginning where there's a history of, of um, the process of reconciliation now. I'm gonna share shortly about my own child. Um, what I just mentioned earlier about um, being expelled myself from the Oakland Public School District and falling through the cracks there, I actually had to send my son back to school there, my six-year-old child. Um, when we went back home to our reservation community, my um, daughter that's in kindergarten is the only native girl in kindergarten. My seventh grader is the only native seventh grader that's there um, in a community that is 80% white, that we are a very small percentage of, of the population, but you know, it shouldn't be that, that my children in a community where my ancestors have been for generations, that my kids are the only ones represented in those grades. At the age of six years old, my son went to school, he was standing up and he was putting his papers away, his homework papers away at his desk. The teacher came over and told him that he needed to sit down. First grade, he's putting his papers away like he thinks he's supposed to. The teacher comes up and punches him in the shoulder that day and um, he comes home and tells me about it. I take him directly to Tribal Health Center. We have it documented. He has documented contusion on his arm. The following day, he goes back to school. He's interrogated by the Shasta County Sheriff's Department. Full body armor, full bulletproof vest. Um, you know, they are, are fully loaded, um, you know, in, in their weaponry. And they, I asked to go in to speak with my son. I'm told that it's a private matter, that if I was there, that it would influence, um, you know, his, um, his responses. I tell my son, if the sheriffs come up to interview you the following day, you tell them that you want your mom. You have the right to say, I want my mom. He goes, so they come in, um, you know, dressed in plain clothes the following day, three of them to interview him. And this, mind you, for him, you know, telling that he was hit by his teacher, he's now being criminalized and, and questioned. And so the three plain clothes officers come in. He tells them, I want my mom. And they tell him, this is a private matter. You don't need your mom here right now. And so I had to remove my son from that school after um, he, he was able to change classrooms, but he still saw that teacher every day because that teacher was the one that implemented the Fun Friday activities and the physical education activities. My son was made to sit in a classroom every day for the remainder of the school year, and again, treated like he did something wrong, like he was being punished for um, speaking out. And so I sent my son, uh, made the very tough decision to have to send my son um, to Oakland with his father to the Oakland Public School District um, that expelled me. And he's actually doing very well. He is getting reading awards. He has student of the month awards. Um, he's, he's very much excelling there. And, and it was an issue of you know, him having the long, being the only native boy with long hair at that school um, was, was really difficult for him. And I'm actually in the process of relocating right now because I will not have my six-year-old daughter that's going into first grade um, in any interaction with that teacher and I won't have her in a situation where she's gonna be treated like and be punished like she did something wrong um, and left out of physical education and fun activities um, because of that interaction with that teacher. So um, Amanda, you know, Judge Teske has centered us in history and Morningstar is, is now reminding us that, that of the young people that we're here to talk mm -hmm. about and the voices of the young people that that really matter in, in um, any of the work that we do. Uh, so I wonder if you would just talk about the importance of centering youth voice in policy development and the ways in which we should be mm -hmm. thinking about doing that. And before you answer, just a reminder to you all to write your questions on your index cards and email your questions if you're watching on the internet to events at class.org and we'll come to your questions in just a second. Wonderful. Um, so one thing that we all have in common in this space is at one point we were a young person, right? Um, granted, our experiences in the classroom varied based on our own identities or experiences that we've had because of systems of oppression. Um, 
But all too often, this one thing that we all have in common, really focus on our age, it's easy to forget that, to erase it, and ignore it. So young people day to day are facing ageism. We're not believed when we're voicing our concerns about the way we're being treated or the things that we want or need or deserve. So for me and my work, I believe policy is one of the many tactics that can be used to elevate and center young people's voices. Um, but for me, I'm perplexed why there's this disconnect between adults and young people if we all were once a young person, right? Um, so participatory governance in and of itself should be what democracy is, right? We live in a democracy, yet we need to use terms like participatory governance. And so right now in New York City with the Young Women's Initiative, we're really centering this model because elected officials, at the end of the day, they work for us. They're supposed to be reporting to their community, to their constituents, and that means young people too. But because of civic engagement and voting laws and also voter ID laws, young people are disenfranchised all the time. And so for me, I'm, I'm really, I like to emphasize the importance of policymakers, but also folks who work at organizations or in philanthropy to really think about when you're making a decision about a young person, are they at that table with you? And so for us, with the Young Women's Advisory Council, it's a central part to the Young Women's Initiative because we have over 20 young girls of color, ages 13 to 24, who are sitting at the table with us. They're the ones advising us on our education policy platform, on what they need their teachers to do better on. They're advising us on what NYPD needs to do better on when interfacing with them. And they're also advising solutions on how we can expand our summer youth employment. They're also um, really telling us what needs to be included in comprehensive sex ed. Because yes, even though we were once adults and we think we would know the answers to those solutions, to those problems, we still have those years between our own experiences and when we were a young person. And even just hearing the own stories on this panel is that young people experience things very differently because of racism and because of sexism um, and ageism all interwoven together. So really, again, when it comes to me and like youth policy, I think it's, it's common sense, right? We shouldn't have to use terms like participatory governance or challenge each other and how we're centering young people, that should be the given, but unfortunately it's not, so we all need to do better. Thanks, Amanda. Erin, you know, our, our goal today is to really talk about solutions and, and what works, and I wonder if you would just talk about what worked for you and in your work and in your experiences, what you have observed that, that also works for uh, young people to really ensure that we are removing the barriers to opportunity for the, the genius that they are. Um, as we spoke earlier uh, about the one size fits all or that silver bullet, I don't think it's no one answer to this issue and many other issues that we deal with in our communities. But the main thing that got me through was the support and the feeling that I was a part of something bigger than myself or just part of society in a whole. Prison can be very traumatic. Um, the street life is very traumatic. And it, pay, it, it plays an effect on your confidence, your feeling of deserving, you know. So being released, being part of AmeriCorps, being part of the Power Corps, just putting on a shirt for validation, it made me feel like I was somebody and I could be better. So I would say we got to support those who go through this trauma or those who make those mistakes as long as they're willing to change because we are only as strong as, as our weakest link. So with that, we'll turn to questions from, from you all. Um, are there questions in the room? Or questions from online? Okay, well with that, can I just ask you all to give us some words of wisdom, words of advice for, for moving the work forward in our various places um, and do so in about 30 seconds or less. <laughs> Judge Teske, we'll start with you. So I think the best approach to juvenile justice in, in realizing and making an investment uh, for, uh, for our youth of, of color is to apply the de epidemiology approach, the study of diseases. Think about it for a moment, ladies and gentlemen. In our study of diseases, there's three things that happen. Number one, we identify at-risk populations. Number two, identify the underlying reasons why they're at risk. And number three, develop treatment modalities to prevent 
and cure those diseases. Now, I want you to substitute the word disease with disruptive behavior and delinquency. You see, diseases do not occur by chance. Mm -hmm. Diseases are not randomly distributed. Neither are disruptive behaviors and delinquent behavior. They are not randomly distributed. Do they, they do not occur by chance. The problem in many of our juvenile justice systems today is that we are treating the symptoms. We are punishing the symptoms. We are not identifying the underlying causes and seeking solutions, the root of that delinquent behavior. And that's what we need to be doing. That, is, that should be our charge. Thank you, Judge Stefke. Amanda? Um, so a very important framework is intersectionality. Um, and it's this belief that we all live multi-issue lives. So the fact that I am a woman, I am a Latina, um, I am a citizen, I am college educated, I come from a lower income background, that informs my experience in the world. And all too often, public policy and folks who are working in government aren't thinking about intersectionality. So it goes back again to this one size fits all, which is not the case. So really my last few words of wisdom is how are we all using our own experiences of both privilege and also our own experiences of oppression to inform the work, especially when it comes to youth of color and then bringing gender into that because we can't forget our girls of color. Thank you, Amanda. Aaron? Uh, I would say that uh, we got to humanize everyone and treat each individual differently as far as customizing the needs of that individual. I think if we continue to, you know, each one just pull one in and as we progress, I think we can see a lot of change. In fact, uh, I was talking to Anthony Smith a little earlier about a situation I was talking to a young guy that he was, you know, just released, had one year of probation to walk off and he was just feeling down and out and he was talking about suicide. Now I want to help this guy, but I'm not equipped to deal with situations like that. I have no psychology degree or nothing, but me reaching out to Anthony, he explained to me that I have to build my network out too, so that when I do come across these situations that I can't handle, I know where to point him to, and I can be an intercessor to the network, and he'll trust that they'll help. So that's all I got. Thank you, Aaron. Morning, Sai. Um, I'd like to end with, so the incarceration rates for Native peoples are 38% with are 38% higher than the national average. And just in the past five years, there's been a 27% increase in federal prisons. Um, there's such a high increase because Native peoples, um, when there are charges on the reservation, they're being charged at higher rates than off the reservation. So we're seeing higher rates of youth being charged as adults. And we're seeing um, overall these increased rates. Um, Native young women are 1% of the general population, but they are 3.5% of all girls incarcerated. And so I have, I have nieces and nephews this summer that are looking, seeking out work, they're seeking out um, employment opportunities, but there's barriers to that. There's barriers in terms of, of access to transportation in rural tribal communities. There's, um, uh, there's barrier, economic barriers for you know, the local whether it's fast food places or local employment in the area, many places are, are charging um, employment application fees now. Who has you know, 10 to $20 to even fill out a job application per application to submit? So how do, how do I encourage my nieces and nephews you know, to be able to go routes? And, and, and then when we're talking about you know, juvenile fel felony charges you know, and, and interaction within the juvenile justice system, you know, how likely are they to be hired Hired on, and so I appreciate the conversations um, earlier, you know, about access to employment because this is the time to invest in our youth. This is the time that we've heard we've heard the why, and now we need to really focus on the investment piece. Thank mm -hmm. you. So please join me in thanking our panel: Morning Star Gali, Aaron Kirkland, Amanda Matos, and Stephen Teske. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Allison. So we will transition now to our second panel. Um, I'm going to ask that folks join me on the panel um, now, and we'll, we'll get started right away so that we can make sure that we're good on time. We'll keep it moving. <laughs> um, 
So this, this conversation, we were just kind of setting the context, um, setting the stage, and, and understanding the landscape in which we are operating. Uh, this next panel is to really talk about policy to practice, and what are the, the pieces of the work that have to happen, how do we do this well, um, and we're really talking about the assets that we're leaving on the table, that, uh, you know, we mentioned the, the barriers to opportunity for young people of color, and uh, we are all losing out when the, the barriers that are erected uh, because of the nation's racial illness remain, and so, how can we really try to get at the, the uh, root cause of that illness and address it? And so we're gonna really talk about, and speaking about intersectionality, the, is, the ways in which issues intersect, and we'll talk about education and uh, the workforce. Um, you know, the Civil Rights Data Collection was just released by the Department of Education a couple of weeks ago. And we see in that a tremendous reduction in the number of students that have been suspended from school, which is incredible but we also see persistent racial disparities, even higher racial disparities than we've seen in, in previous years. And so that lets us know that racial illness is still very much present. Um, and when we think about the, the life trajectory of young people of color and school and jobs and uh, higher education, et cetera, that, that whole trajectory is what we have to be focused on. And so this panel, I'm so excited to, to talk to the folks on this panel about how we do that well. Um, a reminder, again, if you are tweeting, if, if you're joining online, to be use, using the hashtags unrealized justice and realized youth justice. Um, and write your questions on the index card in your folders if you're here in person, and email your questions to events at class.org uh, if you are joining online. Um, and uh, with that, then, I will turn to this wonderful panel. Uh, to my immediate left is Jamal Jones, who is co-executive director of the Baltimore Algebra Project in Baltimore, Maryland, just up the street. Next to him is Dr. Atiyah Martin. She is the chief resilience officer for the Mayor's Office of Resilience and Racial Equity in Boston, Massachusetts. Juan Gomez is co-founder and director of programs and innovation at Motivating Individual Leadership for Public Advancement, or MILPA, in Salinas, California. And uh, next to him is Clyde McQueen, President and CEO of the Full Employment Council for Kansas City, Missouri. And then we have Keisha Bird, who you all know. She is the Youth Policy Director of CLASS here in Washington, D.C. Uh, so welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I guess my first question is uh, just to all of you about the ways in which the various issues intersect and overlap and the way that we uh, can think about bringing those conversations together. So Jamal, we'll start with you. Oh Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hi everybody, I'm Jamal Jones. Before I get to speaking, I want to just kind of set the table by being like, um, I like to be real candid, real colorful, real direct with my language while we're talking. So I just want to make sure that folks are aware of that before I say anything that might sound a little graphic. Um, but I think one of the things that, to answer the question for me is, it's a question of how we identify like what the issues are. And really it's a question of like epistemology, like how do we know the things that we know? So earlier the judge blessed us with a little bit of knowledge about kind of some of the history about how this got set up. But if you go back even further, right, back during the time where the West was being developed, Cornell West speaks about a lot of this in his writing, but back when the West was being developed and what academia in the West was supposed to be was being developed, it was really based on these ideas of a lot of really old white philosophers who didn't really have a great sense of what it would be like to have developed an entire infrastructure that would become like America, this constitution, or this, this constitution of states and people and communities that we have now while including communities of color. So in, in a sense, one of the issues right now is that people, young people in particular, but boys, men of color, young women of color, they really are living within a system that just wasn't built for them in the first place. So really most, I, I like to identify as an outlaw. One, because it sounds cool, but also it's like the truth, right? <laughs> it's the truth, right? We were, there was a system, there was a structure, it was built, it was intentional for who it would serve. And now what we're doing is trying to retool the system to try and be able to make it fit people. But sometimes the shoe just don't fit. Mm -hmm. 
And so there's like this question of whether or not we're trying to change the game or even the playing field. And I think one of the ways in which that we go about identifying the issues and kind of being able to address the intersectionality of it is to actually just go ahead and change the game, right? Mm -hmm. we, can't, we can't work towards small adjustments is going to take a really big movement. And I'm going to just go ahead and say this. I'm a big advocate for reparations. Now, whatever form that takes is different. Ta-Nehisi Coates talks about it a lot in his um, case for reparations. And there are a lot of other instances where individuals talk about it. But in order for us to actually close this gap that we're all trying so desperately to close, we're talking about a massive investment in young people, boys and men of color, women of color, and really being able to create a space for people to build up systems, structures, and institutions for black and brown men and women to be able to do for themselves. Thank you. Up here. Thank you. So first of all, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, Mayor Walsh, unfortunately, couldn't be here. So you have me today. Congratulations. <laughs> um, so this question of how all of these different issues connect to one another um, is really uh, rudimentary to me, is really basic, right? And that is racism. I mean, at the very core of all of this is um, not just racism in the context of someone is racist, right? Because that's the common discourse today. You want to pick up, root out the one person who's the racist and remove them from this, the picture, and all of a sudden things are magically going to be better. But has that actually worked? Mm. Right? We have not seen that work. And so we know that what what racism is today is much more insidious, much more um, under the surface of what we see in front of our faces. We see all of these incidents happening in, um, in the workplace, in um, our communities, um, in education, um, and the way that they play out um, consistently, disproportionately impact communities of color. And so in my role as Chief Resilience Officer, um, most people are probably like, what, is, what does resilience have to do with racial equity? and racism. So the grant that currently funds me and has uh, chief resilience officers all across the world right now, um, there are 100 cities across the world that 100 resilient cities, which was started by the Rockefeller Foundation, created. Um, and so the idea here is that cities are identifying their biggest challenges that we are facing and tackling them head on across different silos. So kind of removing those barriers and people working in their specific issue areas and making sure that we are focusing with laser beam precision on the biggest challenges. And then when we look at that within the context of resilience, so resilience in the way that 100 Resilient Cities talks about it is about the ability of individuals, communities, organizations, assets um, to be able to survive, adapt, and grow after emergencies, both the chronic stresses we face in our communities that are tearing at the fabric of our communities every day, things like racism, things like violence, things like um, uh, low investment in infrastructure, high unemployment rates, as well as the way that we normally think about emergencies, the big disasters, storms, and things like that, terrorism. And so it's the recognition in the way that 100 Resilient Cities talks about it that what happens when these big emergencies occur is based on what is happening in communities every day. There is no difference. And you can predict the outcomes of what's going to happen based on what's happening in communities around infrastructure and the way people are having to live. So if we know that in terms of the people who are living in our communities, which is generally the thing we don't talk about in resilience, it's not, we usually talk about climate change and stuff. And that's fine, and it's, that stuff is important, but it all has to be in the context of putting people first. And if we're looking at the challenges that our communities are facing in terms of this social piece of resilience, then we have to look at the inequities and what is in the way of our communities having access to the types of opportunities, the types of communities that we all should have. Um, what are the barriers to that? And that biggest barrier is racism, the biggest barrier between us and opportunities, um, and the biggest barrier between us and each other in terms of respecting each other's humanity, as someone on the previous panel said, is racism. And we don't like to talk about it because it's uncomfortable, because we all have an individual responsibility in it. Institutions have a policy responsibility um, in, the, in how we look at issues and how we look at the way we do jobs programs and how we look at the way we do our budgets. Um, and we have to ask additional questions of ourselves, like 
who is going to be disproportionately burdened if we make this decision, if we take away this program, if we add this other program? Do, who did we engage as we were trying to make these decisions? What are we going to do as an institution to address the inequities that we're finding as we dig into the data, as someone talked about earlier? So, and not just what do we want to tell residents to do, what are we as an institution of government going to do differently? And then at that, at that other level is institutions are made up of people, right? They're not these random gray buildings. There are people inside of those buildings, so policy is important. Practice is important too, and what we coach people through in terms of what they're bringing through the doors of those institutions and how they're making decisions that impact real people in our communities and the bias that we're all exposed to for across all races, um, that that ultimately plays into the decisions that we're making in government. So we have the historical context, the social context, as well as this context around we're all infected with the, you call it racial illness, right? The ingredients that make racism possible um, and so institutions have responsibility, but also we cannot point the finger at everybody else. We all as individuals have a responsibility. People of color and white people are like, we have work to do. So I'm gonna end there because I feel like I've been talking too long. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Akia. Juan? Yeah, can you repeat the question real quick? <laughs> yes. So I'm, I'm wondering about the intersections between the issues when we talk about education and the workforce. What are, what are the intersections that you see and the opportunities for us to be thinking about solutions at those various places of overlap. Okay, um, well, good afternoon, buenas tardes. My name is Juan Gomez. Um, my family is from south of the border and in Texas, from Nahuatl speaking peoples. I'm from the Cahuitaica Nation. Um, so I acknowledge these four directions, the Piscataway people. It's important to acknowledge that intersection right there because it was the Iroquois Nation, that federation which these founding fathers looked to for a governance structure, council, and direction, but they forgot to take some some nuggets, which is that it was a matrilineal society, right? Um, so it makes me really good, feel good in here that this uh, panel right here is pretty balanced that way. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I think it's important that as a movement, we make a pivot collectively on a post-Obama plan, <laughs> a post-Obama vision, and understanding not just the planning, not just the action, but the rules of engagement. Because when we're going to be facing power, there's going to be a power shift exchange, whether it's Hillary or Trump. We have to be on point. We have to be coordinated. We have to be audacious. And we have to have palabra, a sense of, of common values. For me, more than anything, it's around not just bringing youth to the table. Because it's really easy to do that. It's sexy. And I heard people even right here, what they talk about is, you know, bring in the prosecutor, bring in the mayor and all this. I want to bring in the grandmas. I want to bring in the uncles. I want to bring in the daddy and the uncle. I want to bring the homeboy. Because if we're not careful, we uncon unconsciously uh, lock out community and voice and representation and dialogue. And if we're not careful, what happens is, and this goes to a lot of us, we unconsciously, and I'm going to use the word unconsciously a lot of times, is make systems bigger faster, stronger, less equipped to respond to the needs and you know, requests of the community. You know, so I think it's really, it was really important for us to not just think about you know, the next policy platform. And when my sister here talks about intersectionality, I think about Kathy Cohen, right? She, and and uh, it's called uh, Punks, Bull Daggers, and Welfare Queens. The concept of intersectionality is really not looking at, at theories and, and politics, but going into like transformational agendas and collectives, we can look at solidarity, right? We need to start talking about movement building, organizing, mobilizing, most importantly, decolonizing. And that's how I think about this mm -hmm. work. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Clyde? Yes, this is uh, in this role that I'm in right presently, um, I've kind of come the whole gamut. Uh, recruited big companies to communities, uh, packaged loans for companies, with the presumption that all of those total economic development efforts will have a direct impact on underserved communities. And the one thing that I think everybody makes, including our policy makers and everybody else, assumes a presumption of equity. Mm -hmm. 
in the economic systems, educational systems, even job training systems, uh, and presume that those systems as designed will impact everybody equally when in fact they are organized on the basis that everyone who accesses them has everything that they need. Mm -hmm. And the net result is, is that those people who have greater needs, uh, fewer networks, more gaps, are dysfunctional within those systems. So when you make that presumption, then that means as you design programming, that you have to design it from the lowest common denominator, not the easiest denominator. And typically in policy, um, when you are doing it, whether you're setting up a program or trying to do a systems alignment, the presumption is to do that with the least resistance um, and to focus on bringing in the systematic leaders without looking at what I call the end user, uh, which is a customer mm -hmm. who makes a choice because at the end of the day, we're trying to work ourselves out of business, as I see it. And too frequently, we look at customers as a nuisance. And how do we look at looking at those things in a way that puts us out of business? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm, as, as you hear, I mean, I, that $10 a day application thing, I still can't get my head wrapped around that. I mean, that's the most amazing thing I've ever heard in my 30 years in this business. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that as we look at those things, that's what I hope we can line those things up with. Thank you, Clara. Thank you, sir. Yep, so um, the way that I come to this work is really thinking about, because um, I definitely believe that while we're trying to change the game and start a new platform, that we have a role um, to, to hold our federal policy makers accountable, that public policy at the national and at the state, and as we heard from the mayor earlier, at the local level really matters. It should first be built on this experience and acknowledgement the judge mentioned earlier um, from the experience of Aaron that Juan talked about. But at the same time, it also needs to be one um, at scale and large enough, really, one to uh, right some of the wrongs that we, we talked about, the racial illness, but also really to break down the barriers that really exist to put um, young people on a track to success. And so that includes, as we bust out the silos, as we really think about what investments mean, um, it doesn't, it means that we need to target these investments. We need to target them with resources at scale. We have enough resources in this country to target at scale, but yet we face um, talks about the you know, Budget Control Act, about sequestration, about um, you know, you know, investing in the military versus investing in communities. And as, as the mayor, um, as um, Atea spoke, is that a lot of these crises are just a power keg about to blow because we've had decades and decades of disinvestment. And so one, we need investment at scale. We need new ways of governance. And Amanda spoke so eloquently about that. Not only do young people have to be at the center, but all community residents, um, mamas, uncles, homeboys, <laughs> and all that, but also the leadership at the mayoral level. Um, and, and it can open up opportunities and an atmosphere for state policymakers. Sometimes the state isn't the lead. I mean, the judge you know, led a lot of those reforms from Clayton County mm -hmm. to push Georgia into a new way. Sometimes federal, federal um, you know, policymakers aren't the lead, but they should not be the barrier to holding back progress. And so how do we have a feedback loop from the local level on down so that the federal government does provide resources, but also some states won't come aboard, some cities won't come aboard. And so we're gonna need the carrot and the stick because we know that, um, and we have a history of states that don't come aboard. Uh, we have many states who didn't do Medicaid expansion, for example, um, and they haven't come aboard. And so we have to make sure that when those states, um, uh, those policymakers are not really thinking critically and adequately about a racial equity lens, about the decisions that they make, that there is some kind of federal response and recourse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, speaking of targeted resources, Clyde, I wonder if you would talk about how, um, you know, youth employment, um, youth opportunities for work and um, the work that's happening in Kansas City is actually 
encouraging and supporting equity in, uh, in the city? Well, we make, we make three presumptions when we're working with our youth of color, our opportunity youth as we call them, and then poor youth in general. And the first assumption that we make is that they are smart, but that they, do, they make decisions based upon what makes sense to them in the context of their life. So we have to program for that. That means we don't have programs all split all over the place. That means we put as many programs together as we can. That means that whenever we have a program with the system, that it's not a one-off program over here on the side of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. This is the only place where it is, then it doesn't need to exist. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't have enough market attraction for the people want to belong with it, then it doesn't need to be hanging out there, so we don't. So main thing is co-location is very important to us. A second is a systems integration, and by that I mean a person that's in a GED class, why can't he at the same time also sign up for a skill training program? Even though he might not have a GED, doesn't mean he can't learn a skill. Mm -hmm. So we don't give him that artificial barrier, first you gotta do A and B and C, because many people who are unemployed and have lack of resources don't have the time to be trying to do one thing first and the sex thing second. They need to be able to program as much as they can because their lives are complicated and there are obligations that come along with that. A uh, third, we need to also understand, and I think somebody mentioned earlier about uh, transportation, child care, but I will put mental health as a key ingredient into it. Uh, and I got my input into it by watching that movie Antoine Fisher. And if you ever watched Antoine Fisher, you know about the whole issue of trauma mm -hmm. and mental health and the impact that it has on people. And so we have to make sure, because I can never remember this um, young man who, who comes in, and sometimes we you know, set up these interviews, and this young man, kept coming into me and he kept saying, I don't know why I keep doing this, you know what stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, he keeps doing it because he keeps getting triggered by something that happened to him that he has know nothing about. So we have to teach them how to manage those things. Mm -hmm. Because getting a job is important, but keeping the, keeping the job is what gets them from point A to point B. And sometimes we put a lot of focus on people getting jobs, but not keeping them. And then the net result is all you have this churn. And what we have to do as a system is to focus upon what we do. And then thirdly, as, as I say, and I think the main thing is that whatever we do, we have to make sure that child care is available to a lot of people because a lot of people with kids who can't afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, second thing is that recognize that there are still territories in the places that we serve. I'm on a, and you see Kansas City on cops a lot, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know what they're gonna do. The issue of territoriality in young people is still a very big issue yeah. in our community. Yeah. And some cannot go to point A to point B uh, to even go to schools with a training program because there's danger that's implied there. So we have to make sure that those types of things are taken into consideration when we offer programming. Yeah. And that enables us to spend less money. We queue it up like an RFP. We make sure that they check the boxes before we initiate the limited investments that we have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Juan, with the, the assumptions that, that Clyde has given us, that young people are smart and that they're going to make decisions that make sense for them in their world. What are some of the things that we can be thinking about in addition to what Clyde just laid out that make sense for young people mm -hmm. and that really come from a place of power? Yeah, <clears throat> well I think one of the most important things in acknowledging what Clyde said here is that we presume that our people are sacred. And we also presume that it, we cannot just focus on the policies, programs, and systems and forget about the people. Usually that's what we do, and then we have a nice little publication and be like, and the conditions are still the same. I heard Mr. Austin talking about Baltimore. If you go to the east and west of Baltimore, you're like, man, dilapidation, dilapidation, dilapidation. But you can say, I, I brought the conference here, mm -hmm. right? So things like that. I also think about that as someone who works in the grassroots, who used to be at a foundation, who go ups and downs, presents and all these things, is that we have to, move away from just uh, this concept of disparity and inequity to opportunity, money, power, and respect. We gotta start thinking like that. We gotta come from that place, from a place that's visionary, that's a that we have a decolonized imagination of what is possible. Because oftentimes, you know, even though you remove those shackles, their brain and their mind, psychology, and spirit is still there. We have to do a lot more, you know, thinking about, Audre Lorde said that, we can't continue to use the master's tools. So when we're working with young people, not even with young people, I focus on folks mainly from the ages of 16 to 32, right? What happens is that they have such uh, 
pedagogy and imagination of deficit and liability of hurt and, and shame that we as leaders, you know, creating a more leaderful network like a lot Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. that we really have to inspire something that's possible and we have to be yes, 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 because so many of our people have been told no, 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 and that comes out. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when we have opportunities, we'll sabotage opportunities, we'll just say, nah, I can't do that. That's for the white folks. Right? No, hell no. That's for our people. Mm -hmm. They ask me sometimes, why do you live in Santa Cruz, Juan? Man, I'm occupying this place, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm gentrifying over there, you know? I'm trying to all my people over here, you know? However, I think a lot of people forget that working with young people, young adults, you know, men and women that have experienced social historical trauma, incarceration, or even coming back from the university, are so displaced from who they truly are that they're so busy chasing the carrot that they forgot about the stick, their values, the, the sense of family, mm -hmm. right? So we often talk about the youth, but sometimes we forget like, well, do the youth exist outside of the family structure and the parents? You know, so those type of things we have to take into account. Um, and, and, and the work that we do, it's really important that they're connected to kind of intergenerational infrastructure of leadership. And, 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 a, and, a, and, a, and a structure that allows them to explore their social and emotional outlook on life because we can provide them a lot of these things, you know, vocations, pathways to universities, but what happens, at least what I've been noticing is that I'm losing them so many times because of unconscious fear and shame. You know, so a place that's restorative, not just progressive, restorative, that's reconnecting them to who they truly are and a kind of a, a rites of passage and initiation into adulthood of what it means to be a good young man, a good young woman, you know, because right now, take San Francisco, the, the children's population is plummeting, right? Everyone's so busy chasing tech and startups that you can't find children, it's too hard to even live. So, you know, like I said, it's that work of connecting youth and what does it mean for young people, it's really around, like I said, cultivating a place where they can aspire to be the best that they can be and not settle on piecemeal reform, but on, on a, like holistic transformation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Juan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Atiyah, the, this notion of um, colonization really manifests in structural inequity and <laughs> systemic inequity. And so I wonder how resilience, and you know, we've seen conversations about grit and resilience in young people and making sure that they, they can um, survive and overcome the systemic challenges that, that they face. So how, how is, is your work connected to really also dismantling structural barriers? So I, I kind of talked about some of that before, but what I, I do want to kind of pause on this concept of grit and resilience at the individual level, right? Because there's levels to this, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about resilience, I've been talking about it at the community level. At the individual level, what I want to make sure that we don't do is place an unnecessary burden on our young people to have to navigate through this world and pull themselves up by their bootstraps mm -hmm. and kind of fall into mm -hmm. this this belief that we live in a meritocracy when what we need is for them to understand that we don't, that there is racism, that they actually, um, much of their history and their contributions to, to this society has not been part of how they've been educated. And so how do we make sure we bring those pieces back into the table to your point around uh, making sure that we're anchoring our children back into um, who they are, what they've contributed to, um, to this world, to the United States, um, and making sure that we're giving our children the tools to survive and thrive, right? And so, we, so that means we have to navigate both levels. So we, we have to instill that in them at the individual level, but not outside the context that we live in a society that is racist. And so we have to be also working at the policy level. So the work that we are looking to do in the city of Boston is, is very much in its early stages. And as part of the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, we're looking at how do we institutionalize equity within the way that we're doing business as government. Not because it's the, a nice thing to do, not because it's the right thing to do. It's our responsibility. It is not just our responsibility because Atiyah says so. It's our responsibility because at the end of the day, there are four pillars of government. One is about, and the three most people are used to us talking about, you know, uh, economy, 
uh, how are we spending our money, efficiency, how well do our processes work, um, effectiveness, did we actually achieve the outcome that we set out to achieve? And then the last piece is around equity. That was added in 2005 as the four pillars of government. So it is not an option around whether or not we should be talking about this equity piece and racial equity and all those other things. So I just want to put that out there in terms of as we frame these issues that is really um, multi-leveled and as we talk about that grit piece that we don't let it just sit there because we do, it is not fair to our children that they always have to start from zero and that there's this constant struggle and they have to figure out how to do this, 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 this hard work from scratch. Mm -hmm. When they don't do well, it's the fault of us as adults and we have to figure out how to make that better for them. Thank you, thank you, Akia. Jamal, you, um, you know, thinking about young people surviving and thriving is, is a really important um, tenet of your work at the Baltimore Algebra Project and I wonder if you would just talk more about why and how that is a priority for you. Sure. Um, so one of the things that is really central to the work that we do in the Algebra Project is the idea that young people, or the idea that people who are most impacted by a system or structure are the ones who ultimately are in control of that, regardless of like whatever the conditions may be right now. And so like for us, in terms of like dealing with like youth employment or youth education or whatever the case may be, young people being at the center of that is like a, 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 a very important pencil, principle or pillar. So like we, the, all the work we do falls under this umbrella of the National Student Bill of Rights. And it's essentially a list of 15 rights. Young people came together at Free Minds, Free People's Conference and essentially were like, well, if we were in control of our lives the way that we are and we had the keys to the purse, what would our educational system look like? What does federal protection for education look like so that we can all develop in a way that is equitable? And so there's everything on there from daycare to free college to the high quality food all the way to pieces like free transportation for young people. And I, I say that as, a, as an opener to this because one of the things that we talk about all the time is having young people be able to like do for themselves and one seeing people that are younger, this piece of ageism that Amanda spoke about before, seeing people who are younger as equals in a society is like a, a critical piece. And the reason why I opened before with that, that whole piece of like the where, where the, the West's intellectual spaces come from is that it's based on categories. Mm -hmm. It's like being able to scientifically categorize folks. And one of the things that happens is that young people get put over here and adults get put over here. And with those categories, of course, there comes all of these different qualifications to be in those categories, and as a result, there's a major barrier for how we interact with young people, interact with adults. There's no reason, right, that piece that my man was talking about, about summer, summer drugs, that's like a hot button for me. If you ever want to really piss me off, talk about summer drugs. <laughs> like, really, it, and it's one of those things, it's like nobody in the room would actually say, only hire me for the summer, I'm good with that, <laughs> right? But when we talk about young people, it's like, you only need this, or we'll give you this. And it's a really weird space, because if you talk to a young person, they won't say, I need a summer job. They'll say, I need money, or it, it, and, and that's just real. And so for us, one of the things that we do is all the young people that work with the Algebra Project, regardless of age, regardless of experience, everyone's hired at $10 an hour minimum. And then you pretty much work and do whatever um, organizing or math literacy work that you do and try and scale that up. One of the things that we're doing right now is consciously trying to scale that up so that the, the resources that young people need in order to become autonomous, because that's the other thing, right? If it, I like what you said earlier about if the, the work that we're doing is to be able to stop doing the work, right? One of the things that I talk to folks about in philanthropy often is if we're not funding for autonomy, then we're really treating the investments like expenditures, and what we're actually doing is treating the money, we're throwing it down a toilet rather than putting it into a well, mm. and that's a waste. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is trying to scale it up, so how do we connect this idea of education being controlled by young people to the idea that youth employment as a, like an, in, an economy, an economic engine, how is that also controlled by young people? And so what we're trying to do is get this investment for this, uh, the idea of a peer-to-peer -peer enterprise incubator. I got a nice little business plan right here for anybody who wanna check it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's mad dope. 
But the idea that peer to peer incubator is that young people, right, they have a they have an innate skill and ability to impact other young people that, that adults just don't have. There's a disconnect, those the category, that barrier, right? And so if we capitalize on that social capital that we have and that capacity and infuse cash into that so that young people have jobs to be able to deliver the same skills or, or education or trade or whatever the case is that adults are able to do, then young people then are at a very early age learning how to be able to correct some of those systemic issues that we're talking about. One of the, and that, that, I see the incubator as a, as a means for reparations, right? If we're teaching 14-year-old students how to be able to go and be able to be entrepreneurs and being able to, I, all right, I have a camera. I love doing photography. We equip them with the ability to a job to be able to fund themselves to do that, because let's just be honest, right? Most of what we're all able to do is because we have a job that allows us to do it. There are many community folks that I talk to every day who like would like to come out and do stuff, but at the end of the day, they gotta eat, their kids gotta eat, they can't be in these spaces. So part of it is like being able to, to, to put all of the resources and put organizations together so that they're doing the stuff together. Um, but again, being that young people will have jobs, being able to do the things that they want to do so that they can go on and be businesses, business owners, and be able to do stuff for themselves. Thank you so much, Jamal. So in the interest of time, we'll collect questions online and also from you all here. Uh, but I want to give you all just a, a few seconds of wrap-up time before we, we close out the session. Uh, so Keisha, we'll start with you. Oh, okay, yes. So um, one of the things we definitely wanted to get out um, is that um, building upon everything that we've heard today, um, based on, again, the in entrenched issues, um, we understand the context, we understand the challenge, but we have to really think forward thinking and really think about the opportunity. And we have to also think about, as I mentioned earlier, is that there are real policy levers that we're not taking advantage of fully, no, it is not community. We have to make sure we bring community in that, and that as we're implementing those federal policy levels at the state and local level, that community is central and a part of how those things are implemented. So I'm gonna mention those. We have lots of resources at class, but we'll mention the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, right? It's not a catch, be all, end all. It's not a silver bullet, but it is an opportunity, leveraging opportunity, that we can think about some of the things Clyde said, think about some of the things that Juan said as we're really implementing these things. Um, the Affordable Care Act and, and Medicaid expansion. A lot of what we heard, a lot of what our young people, and just quite frankly our communities are dealing with is a need for healing, a need for um, uh, to, to, to uh, address the trauma from just by living, but in also real trauma if you face incarceration. And so we know there are uh, resources out there, but are those resources culturally competent? Are those resources um, building in you know, all of the things that we know communities of color need for it to be responsive. Um, so I'll mention those two in particular. One last thing also is that Juan said something really important and that's something that we're really embarking on in class is that youth and, and young adults don't exist in silos, they exist in community, they exist in families. And so how do we think about whole, um, how, how do we think about policy to address whole issues? Um, we call it two-generation issues, or it could be multi-generation, but again, in some places, we're talking about a grandmother, a young adult, and as well as a, a, a young person, a baby. And so we have to think about all of those young people together, especially in poor communities, and how policy fixes make a difference. Clyde? Yeah, I, I, three things I'd like to happen. First is I want to make sure that we emphasize to our young people to get off that, that smart pad and start talking and interacting with people outside their neighborhood, particularly <laughs> businesses. Let's bring employers into the neighborhood to talk with young folks so they can expand and get a true idea because that's one of the big issues. Network still is a key way to get a job. It's not on the computer despite what people think. And I can give you the statistics to prove it. So networking and interacting with employers is very important and we should teach them to do that. Uh, secondly, is that we really want to ensure that one thing, a career pathway doesn't start at college, it can't start at high school. So we need to get more robust vocational education programs in the schools so that when you turn 18, you can go to work and then earn your degree or do like to do it the old way. And then finally, uh, is, to, is for us to have rapid response programs. And by that, 
I mean, if somebody has a problem, they can't wait 48 hours because by that time, something else more drastic could happen. So whenever we do do programming, let's make sure it can turn around quickly. And that's very important for trying to engage the same people in employment or education. Juan? <laughs> for me, I think the notion of racial equity is very, very important, you know, but at the same time that it has to be partnered up with racial healing because, you know, some of our white folks, especially our families, our white families, during the American Revolution and the Civil, right, Civil War, they lost so many men, right? And they never stopped to mourn, and it just became patriotic. I do feel oftentimes their stoicness comes from a place of they never were able to mourn, you know? And I think about that when we think about this work holistically, we think about the whole continuum of the school to prison pipeline but in a way where those pathways actually start at elementary and they're being exposed to science, technology, and health, that in high schools and in middle schools that's happening, but also in, in college campus and university, people with, with the ACA, we have the ability to explore provisions around mental health and start changing up the type of data and metrics that we find uh, relevant to ourselves. And I think that it's important for us to think about those next seven generations in a way where we don't, like I said, we, we're not looking for charity. You know, we're looking for change, big, bold, and that if it's not gonna be us, then who? And our young folks, like I said, they, they, they need to be connected to their elders. The reason that I mentioned the whole concept of family is because a lot of times we talk about this work in the context of urban cores. When you go to other place, there is no infrastructure. You have to have the people, and that might be it. It's that uncle, it's that grandma, you know? Like I said, so let's not ever forget that this work doesn't just apply to Atlanta, to LA, to Chicago, right? We're out there too, and in, 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 you know, a lot of times we get overlooked and undermined. Thank you. Thank you, Atiyah. So much to say, so little time. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up with this. Uh, my husband and I have five children. We, I have two of the youngest here with me, Ryan and Sonia, be good over there, I see you. <laughs> um, and so we struggle with this idea of how do you navigate the world, how do you develop young people in a way that allows them to thrive in a world that's not said designed for them to do so. Um, and, and I think as we think about um, how we walk away from here today, and what the work actually is, um, number one, it begins with ourselves. If we are not willing to be open and honest about the fact that we all have work to do as individuals, no matter what race we are, people of color, we are traumatized, we have our own experiences, both the historical context and what's happening today. We have work to do on the fact that we have internalized a lot of the messages about that the world is telling us about who we are and how we're supposed to be, um, and that is fundamentally and detrimentally hurting our children and how they're able to navigate through this world, and you talked about that, the the way that kind of they envision themselves and their place in this world, um, that it's much bigger and bolder and broader than anything that the world is telling them. Um, and this idea that in institutions that we remind ourselves that we are people within these institutions and that's why that individual work is so important because we need to walk through those doors ready to be honest about who we are, what we're bringing to the table, and what ways that we can interrupt that cycle. It takes practice, it takes work, but the urgency is so significant. Our world, our, our country, our cities are not getting less diverse. Yeah. They're getting more diverse and we have to figure this out because our ability to continue to be successful in the United States in our urban centers and, and throughout the country is dependent on our ability to make sure that everyone has access to what they need to reach their human potential, this idea of equity. Um, and so how do we make sure that we're looking at a policy level um, at how we're able to look at that as well, both policy and practice as well as who we are as we walk through the doors of those institutions. And the last thing I'll say um, is that we have to also do it not from this academic framework, that we have to do it from a position of love and humanity um, and recognize that we are all intricately connected to each other and that this work has to be, has to come from that place. Um, it is not in a head exercise, it's a head and heart exercise that we have to combine both. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is a quote, um, my absolute favorite quote that I say everywhere I go, um, it, which is most people don't recognize opportunity because it comes disguised as hard work. We have work to do, it's an amazing opportunity, but at the end of the day, we're gonna have to come together and get that work done. I got that from a Salada tea bag if anyone wants to know. <laughs> done. <laughs>
And a very quick word from Jamal. Uh, do you text this? So my quick thing is five real quick ones. The first is that, just think real fast. The first one is reparations, reparations, reparations. I think that that just is the thing that we need to focus on. That's that, I feel like that's the key to building the equity in terms of like creating opportunity, creating resource in space, that's one thing. The second thing is um, in terms of like policy pieces, one of the things that we talk about a lot in the Algebra Project is if folks invested as much as they do in juvenile justice, if, they, if the juvenile justice investment was equal to the restorative justice effort, there was, in terms of like investment, right, there would be a whole lot more organizations, there'd be a whole lot more folks who have the, the ability and the time to be able to deal with this trauma that we're talking about. The other piece is that um, there, everybody got that one uncle, I call him can't get right, Kevin. You know, Kevin, Kevin is that one uncle that, that come around and everybody's like, oh Lord, there's Kevin. And Kevin, let me get a couple dollars, nephew. I think a lot of times we treat young people like that. We don't, it's like, oh Lord, Kevin needs something. All right, here's twenty dollars. Well, really, what Kevin need is a job. He need a space to live. He need supports consistently. He need somebody to check in on him. And so, if we just stop treating young people like that in general, like as a society, I think we'd be in a better space. And the, one of my other things was just that. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed just on a, on a policy level, on a federal policy level, one of the major barriers to success of like community organizations being able to, or community folks be able to impact, like change stuff on a, on a very local level is the fact that the, the bulk of the dollars are on the federal level, but there's no capacity among smaller groups and smaller institutions to be able to take on those dollars. Like there was one time, I was 17, and I was trying to apply for like, uh, a grant for us to do like youth organizing for something. And it was like a hundred thousand dollar grant. And I was like, yeah, I looked at the guidelines and I cried. It was just bad. So if we can build up community institutions like a capacity to be able to take on those larger grants and get into those spaces, we'll be able to have more resources. And the last thing is if we can have young people in spaces where policies are being developed to be able to direct where that money is going, where folks are actually doing the investing. I think that's a very critical piece. The problem is, again, the, the structure of the system was built so that young people are outlaws. Those meetings, those spaces, they happen during the daytime when you're supposed to be in school. And so, again, I get the need to like work with us, and I get the need to work with the system, but again, ultimately, we gotta change the game. We gotta change the game. So, so join me in thanking this fantastic panel. Thank you to all. And I am now turning it over to Michelle Henry, who is Vice President for Global Philanthropy at J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. Michelle. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to Olivia and Keisha and the entire CLASP team for convening such a thoughtful, powerful, and energetic group of folks is here this afternoon. Thank you. Um, very excited to be here today to join you all for just a few closing remarks, and I'll try to keep them brief because I know that we're just running over time. Um, I know that given that we got homework at the uh, top of the program, that this forum will just be the first of one of several productive conversations, but not just conversations, because talk is cheap, as the mayor said, but we will get to uh, some solutions that really help uh, to support young people as they grow and develop and realize their full potential. Um, I've only been at the firm for about two years, but for the past nearly 20 years, I've actually been working in nonprofits, um, in the criminal justice and workforce space, and really helping to improve and expand opportunities for low-income populations, particularly youth of color and their families. Uh, in fact, my first job when I graduated from the University of Maryland was at an alternative to incarceration program in New York. Um, and while I was there, as I reviewed criminal course court complaints, as I interviewed young people in detention, um, I, heard, I heard their stories. I heard their family stories. I heard the stories of them wanting to contribute to their communities, of them wanting to do better in school but being bored, of them wanting to make money, wanting to work but not really being given the opportunity. 
And I saw up close how quickly uh, it is for young people to become disengaged and to default to poor decision making and impulsive uh, decision making that leads to bad choices. When resources in their communities are uh, scarce, when they're limited, when job opportunities are scarce, and when education and training programs are not adequately preparing them for the jobs that are available. These are jobs that can divert them from the criminal and juvenile justice systems and which can support successful reentry into their communities. Now, overall, there are fewer job opportunities for youth. In fact, we know that employment for teenagers has steadily declined over the last 10 plus years, deteriorate, deteriorating to a much greater degree than for any other age group. Youth are now also facing a labor market that has evolved to require a much more skilled workforce. And according to the US Census Bureau, by about 2020, the majority of Americans under the age of 18 will be persons of color. So as these young people are growing and developing, they are in fact becoming our future workforce. This shift in our country's demographics then requires us to really rethink how we support young people's growth and development, including reducing our over-reliance on incarcerations, incarceration for their mistakes, and changing how we identify and cultivate talent. We know that helping job seekers especially young people of color, gain the skills they need to compete in the labor market is a powerful strategy for expanding access to opportunity and promoting economic mobility. Through efforts that expand college and career awareness, excuse me, college and career readiness in low-income communities and increase access to high-quality post-secondary education, training, and work experiences, Young people can successfully compete for good paying jobs and they can thrive. An equally important result is that businesses benefit from building a larger, more diverse talent pipeline and contribute to economic development in communities. So we launched New Skills at Work, a five-year, $250 million global workforce in this initiative through which we are supporting both private sector efforts that focus on developing talent and best-in-class training providers that work in partnership with employers to create career pathways to increased economic opportunity. And through our fellowship initiative, we are providing young men of color with multiple ladders to success. TFI is a comprehensive program that provides high school students in Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York City with intensive academic support, preparation for college, leadership and career development, and support for their social and emotional development, including mentorships. And I think one of our fellows, Dariel Vasquez, uh, helped with planning the forum and is here, so thank you. <laughs> Now, while a four-year college degree is one pathway, there are many uh, high-demand, skills-based jobs in high-growth sectors available for young people that earn a certificate or credentials, participate in an apprenticeship, or receive a two-year associate's degree. And so earlier this year, we announced a new $75 million five-year global initiative to address the youth unemployment crisis by supporting states' efforts to improve career and technical education systems. Uh, the initiative was launched to uh, dramatically increase the number of young people who complete career pathways that begin in high school and end with post-secondary degrees or credentials aligned with good paying, high demand jobs. When we provide young people with opportunities to build skills, access resources, and develop their networks, they will almost always exceed our expectations. They will surprise and inspire us. Over the next five years, our firm will deploy a, mil a billion dollars towards philanthropic programs focused on boosting economic growth. Uh, on the last panel, the Chief Resilience Officer from Boston talked about responsibility. Well, we believe that the private sector has a responsibility and a very important role to play in helping to address major economic and social challenges. At J.P. Morgan Chase, our global presence, our scale, provides us with unique insight into these issues and the ability to approach them comprehensively, opening new pathways to success. 
and like Mayor Freeman Wilson, we are able to engage diverse stakeholders in the conversations and focus on strengthening systems. At a time when governments are stretched thin, we are expanding our commitment to join with nonprofit, government, academic, and private sector partners to forge solutions. No one sector can do it alone. So we work with partners in the US and around the world to improve access to training for vulnerable youth, to make summer youth employment programs more skills focused, the risk of pissing off Jamal, uh, and, to <laughs> and to compete for the jobs of tomorrow and uh, help them succeed as adults. We will also support data and analysis that equips policymakers and elected officials with critical information to help them make more informed choices. We will catalyze the philanthropic community to join with us in supporting these efforts. And through our amazing grantee partners, we bring the voices of young people to these conversations. So with one minute left, I, I see you, Dariel, I see you there. In closing, my closing remarks, I'd like to again thank CLASP for bringing us together for this important conversation. We are excited about the work that you are doing and we appreciate your leadership on these issues. Thank you. Good afternoon. All right, I'm standing between you and the bright sunshine, so I will be brief. My name is Damon Hewitt. I'm executive director of the Executives Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. Uh, we are a philanthropic network of over 40 foundations committed to a brighter future for our nation's sons and brothers. We do it in a way that tries to center their experiences and their voice. We're on a mission, uh, and it's, it's a bold experiment because people don't think it can be done, to actually have young men of color in particular meaningfully informed philanthropic strategy, hopefully in the exact ways that Jamal Jones talked about. We've made a seed investment to that end in the national network called the National Youth Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. It is a network of networks. If you think about the Dignity in Schools campaign, if you think about the Alliance for Educational Justice, think about Youth Build, all of these networks are part and parcel of this National Youth Alliance. And so we look forward to building deeper relationship and partnership with those organizations and with those young people uh, to actually move philanthropic strategy. Another thing we do is we elevate the leadership voice of foundation executives. Now, as hard as it is sometimes to get a grant, we know how hard it is, how hard it is to get a grant. I was in, in the nonprofit sector myself for many years. It's actually sometimes easier for foundations to write a check and walk away and not actually walk in partnership, walk hand in hand with communities. And the most difficult thing sometimes is for the foundation leaders, the foundation presidents and CEOs to actually be vocal in and of themselves. So we're trying to set a new standard with the foundation presidents and our alliance and our philanthropic network. Uh, starting with a, a public statement supporting the protesters in Ferguson, Missouri during the uprising there, similarly in, in Baltimore. And then more recently, we sent a letter from 27 foundation presidents at the time to President Obama, urging him to ban the box, not only in federal hiring for federal agencies in the White House, but also for federal contractors, because we know that's the real way to get some really deep impacts in society. We also understand that we have to step up as employers ourselves in philanthropy. And so we now have nearly 50 foundations who have accepted what we call the Ban the Box Philanthropy Challenge. That means nearly 50 foundations that have either banned the box themselves or have actually adopted fair chance hiring language. So we're really proud of these efforts and we look forward to working in partnership with that community as well. Just a few quick observations before, as we close. Uh, really, I won't try to sum up everything you heard because it's so powerful. Um, it's really a fork in the road for work focused on boys, women of color, women and girls of color, youth of color in general. We talk a lot about sustainability, but one message I wanna share is that sustainability doesn't, or sustaining, doesn't mean doing the same thing we've been doing. It means getting smarter on crime, like Judge Teske said. It means actually opening up the, the panoply of voices that we hear from, so young people are really centered and informing the work. It means examining, as the mayor said, our own policies and practices in your sector, whether that be philanthropy, whether that be government, whether that be corporate, as Michelle said, whether that be the nonprofit sector itself. Are we actually leading and acting with our own values? It's something we have to check ourselves on every day. Uh, and one thing I'll just say in closing is that 
we want to have studies, we want to have evidence bases, we want to have the research, but at the end of the day, enough is known for action. We don't have to study ourselves into oblivion, otherwise we'll get left behind. Public policy is a beautiful thing. It's what people in this town do. It's what people in these organizations represented in the room do. But here's the thing. We can either make policy happen or policy can happen to us. Which is it going to be? Thank you. That's our charge. All right. I promise I'm actually the last speaker. Um, thank you all again for joining us this afternoon. We're so glad each, of all, each one of you all could make it out. Um, this can formally concludes our conversation, but before you go, um, we would like to invite you all uh, for our event in this fall where we will be exploring more in depth the role of higher education, post-secondary education, and workforce development and training um, in mitigating the collateral consequences of mass incarceration on vulnerable communities. Um, on your way out, there are additional resources that are on the table. If you didn't grab, be sure to grab, and then we also have additional resources online. Please join me in thanking all of our featured speakers, our panelists, um, our partners, and our moderator for this afternoon. Thank you all so much, and we look forward to seeing you this fall.